So, get started on the uh, slide here. So, uh, I'm sure we're going over the ACH 550. So, that's uh, ABB's primary HVAC offered drive. They have another one called the ACH 550. It parks almost identical to this one. That's an industrial drive. So, it's got a logical yeah, role method for how the drive interfaces with the motor that are more tailored to the industrial world, like uh, torque control. The uh, keypad's a little different. They're not interchangeable. So if you have an ACS keypad, you try to plug it into an ACH drive, it'll give you an alarm and tell you the drive doesn't recognize it. So uh, if you're on a job where you see the ACS, that is uh, slightly different from the ACH. So there is some overlap there, but there are a few things that are unique to them as well. So this uh, ACH line build up to 550 horsepower in the 480 volt range. Oh, no. So you're going to have to read a while later in the class. We'll show you all the ratings for the different uh, voltages. I think we talked about it. 200 horsepower in the 600 volt class. So uh, patented harmonics reduction scheme. So what we're talking about there, the harmonic filter I mentioned earlier, uh, typically uh, drive manufacturers across the board, they have to have some means of reducing harmonics so we don't send dirty power back into the building and cause issues there. The uh, patented function that ABB has is what they call a swing choke. So typically the harmonic filter, it's an inductor, and the more you load it down, the more ineffective it is. If you're running a drive at part load, your inductor isn't loaded down as much, so it's not resisting the change in current, and the harmonics can sneak through a lot more effectively. So uh, what ABB came up with with this uh, swinging choke is it will actually follow the load down. So if you go to a partial load on the drive, the inductance on the swinging choke will actually increase to compensate for that. So at partial load, the drive still does a really good job of keeping the harmonics from getting back out into the building. So communication suite, on the 550 we have Modbus. The uh, Johnson N2 protocol, Siemens FLN protocol, and then uh, BACnet as well. So that's actually one of the uh, major differences between the ACH and the industrial ACS drive. The industrial only has Modbus, whereas the HVAC drive has what we would typically run across in uh, building control protocols. And then uh, we have some additional modules as well. They say it fits under the hood, so it doesn't need to be externally mounted. It just plugs into the drive, cover snaps back on. So uh, most common one we'd have there would be lawn works for using lawn. That's not an onboard protocol, so you have to get a module with the drive to talk on the lawn. The so, uh, keypad's removable. You can take that guy off. Most uh, common reason you'd be doing that is once you program a drive, you can back up the uh, program to the keypad and take that and copy it to multiple other drives if you have several drives that are all using the same program. So uh, HVAC drive has what we call scalar and centerless vector mode. Scalar is more of the dumb operating mode, so the uh, faster you tell the drive to go in frequency, the higher it pushes the voltage. In uh, vector mode, the drive is actually watching the rotations on the motor, and uh, it's a much more intelligent mode. It's not quite as efficient, but uh, in uh, scalar, if you tell the drive to go 30 hertz, it sends 30 hertz through the outputs, and the motor knows whatever motor is going to do. In vector mode, the drive will watch the motor, and we actually control based on RPM. So if you tell the motor to run 835 RPM, the drive will do whatever it needs to to that motor to make sure it's doing exactly 835 RPM. So it's something we don't use a whole lot in the HVAC world. Usually, if we're going into vector, it has more to do with compensating for incoming power fluctuations. That's a side benefit of vector is it handles incoming power issues a lot better than scalar does. But for HVAC world, we really don't care if you're a couple RPM fast or slow on a fan or a pump. So that's, that's not really the benefit for us on that side. All right. So hitting hardware first. So uh, got a little diagram here on kind of how a VFD works. So this is a very simplistic version of it, but just showing the high voltage side. So what the drive is doing. So uh, first stage come in, you got your AC power from the utility, hits the drive goes through our uh, diode bridge here, so rectifies it from AC to DC. Then uh, next portion of the drive, we have what we call the DC bus. So this is where the uh, filters live on the drive, what we call a DC choke. So that's what we're using to stop the harmonics on the opposite side of the drive from working their way through the input and getting redistributed in the building there. And then you also got that big capacitor bank there. So really, essentially what you got in these, this first 
two sections on the drive is basically a big DC power supply. We're taking AC in, converting it to DC, filtering it with the big capacitor bank. So the drive is just this big DC power supply. And the last portion on the inverter is where we actually switch the DC to create what the motor will respond to as a varying AC. So you can kind of see here, we'll see some other slides later, but if you have a, uh, a oscilloscope or something where you can really zoom in on here, you'd see these peaks here are actually a series of pulses. So the uh, first pulse is going to be really quick, it'll be on and off, then the next one will stay on a little longer, turn off, and as you get towards the center of that band there, that's where your longest on time will be, and then it starts shortening those pulses up again. So the, the uh, motor, oh, back up there, the motor sees that quick pulse is a low voltage, the longer pulse is a little higher, the longest pulse is higher, so it'll start to look kind of like a sine wave <coughs> to the motor, and then if we want to speed the motor up, we'll increase the frequency of those pulses, squeeze them together time-wise, and that'll make the motor speed up. To uh, control voltage on the motor, it's kind of interesting, the drive is not actually changing voltage to the motor, it's just increasing the amount of time between those voltage pulses. So on a uh, 480 volt drive, once you rectify the incoming AC, you end up with around 650, 660 volts DC. And uh, that, so that's what we got right there, and then that's what the drive is switching. So the motor is actually constantly being hit with these 650 volt pulses of DC power. And then the drive can just increase the time gap between those and the motor will treat it as though the voltage has actually gone down. But in reality, we don't truly change the voltage to the motor. It's always that full DC voltage hitting the motor. So uh, here's our uh, swing choke. So uh, design, again, mentioned that earlier, for uh, reduced harmonics at full and partial load. So partial load is where the swing choke comes into play. A, uh, non-swinging choke, just a line reactor, something like that, would work at full load just the way a, a swinging choke would. But once you go to partial load, that's where the swinging choke starts to become more effective and the line reactor would start to lose effectiveness. The whole point of having a drive is usually so you can slow it down and run at partial speed or partial load. So it really makes sense to have a swinging choke. So uh, it is equivalent to a 5% line reactor. That's a very common number to see in drive specs. They'll say you have to have a 5% line reactor, a 5% DC choke, something like that. So uh, our DC choke is equivalent to a 5% reactor. So we meet the requirement there. The spec is looking for a 5%. And then uh, also, the way the choke is designed, it's uh, more inductance for its size. So we can accomplish the same effective filtering with a smaller choke. And then uh, mentioned earlier, if you get in a uh, ACS320 drive, it doesn't have that choke, so that's how they get those micro drives so small. Uh, what you're running there, if you have a lot of those drives, then you have to provide some other kind of filtering upstream to them. So it's uh, real common to see those 320 drives used in a fan wall application where you have you know, maybe <coughs> 6, 8, 10, 12, however many fans in this fan array, and they'll all be sitting in the, uh, or the drives will all be sitting in the control cabinet and they'll have one big filter that handles filtering for all the drives. So uh, got a little diagram here <coughs> shows the uh, total demand distortion, that's the harmonics getting back out of the drive with the uh, different chokes or no choke at all. So this black line here on the top is what you'd get if you just had a drive like the 320 with no choke. The uh, red is the uh, ACH400, that's uh, the previous generation to the 550. So it wasn't a swinging choke, wasn't quite as effective, and on the bottom there you can see the 550. So that's our most effective one right there. So going over the uh, hardware on the drive, you got uh, two programmable analog inputs. So typically that's going to be a speed command. So it can be either a, a 0 to 10 or a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, and you can also scale that in between those. So you can make it a 5 to 10 volt or a 2 to 10 or a 0 to 8 volt, whatever you want. But full scale is uh, 0 to 10 volts or 0 to 20 milliamps. So two programmable analog outputs. So the outputs are uh, milliamp signal from the drive. So those can be assigned to any analog function in the drive. So if it speeds up and slows down, if the temperature goes up and down, it could be torque, frequency, kilowatt hours. So you can assign any of those functions to that analog output and monitor that through your control system. We got our uh, six digital inputs, so that's going to be some function that's an on or an off we're sending to the drive. 
typically you're going to have your start stop there if you have a safety circuit, a damper interlock, something that's either it's there or it's not. That's going to be on one of our digital inputs. Then uh, last one, we got three onboard relay outputs. You can uh, add a option module to get three more. So if you're using all three relays and you still need more relay outputs, you can plug that module into the drive and it'll give you a six total. So the uh, relays, kind of like the uh, analog outputs, you can assign them to any function in the drive that in this case would be an on or an off function. So is the drive running? Is it not running? Is there a fault? <coughs> Something like that. The drive's ready or not. So let you know all the interlocks are present, drives ready to run. There's uh, also a function in the drive for uh, programming. See so a little farther on, you can look at any function in the drive and assign a threshold. They call that supervision. So you can tell the relay above 30 hertz, close the relay below 30 hertz, open the relay. So you can uh, kind of use a analog function and assign which threshold within that you want to use to open and close the relay. So a lot of different things you can accomplish with those relays. So cooling fan is logic controlled. If the drive's running, it will turn the fan on. If the drive isn't running, the fan will switch <coughs> off. So this cooling fan isn't just sitting there running for no good reason if the drive isn't producing heat. The uh, most recent firmware on the drive actually now gives us the option to set it to be on full time as well. So say you have a situation where the drive's in a dirty environment and you don't want to have dust and stuff getting a chance to settle in the drive, you can just leave that fan running full time so it's always moving air through. But default out of the box, the fan will shut off within a minute of the drive, turning off its outputs, and then anytime you start the drive up again, the fan turns on again. So uh, easy to remove, they're just a little, you can't see in the picture, but you pop the fan off the top of the drive, there's just a little pigtail plug you undo and swap out the fan if the fan fails. So that's a uh, nice feature, especially if you're used to the older generation of ABB drives where they had the fan mounted in the back and you had to take a bunch of components off the drive to get to this cooling fan. So now it's just a quick unplug it, plug the new one in, and you're done. So we have a uh, built-in uh, RFI or EMI filter, so that's either radio frequency interference or electromagnetic interference. Not something we run into a whole lot stateside. Uh, Europe has uh, much tighter regulations on that than we do, so this drive is designed to be sold in a worldwide market. We have that feature in the drive used a lot more in Europe than you would over here. So I've only had a handful of jobs where we've actually had the customer ask, does your drive have this filter? If you do, can you turn it on? So uh, kind of the uh, interesting side note on that filter, if you're using the drive with its onboard clock to run on its own schedule, so say it's a standalone installation and in the drive doesn't have a separate control system telling it when to start and stop during the day. Uh, ABB figured out that the clock is actually a lot more accurate if you turn the filter on. So it should have nothing to do with the uh, clock itself, but for whatever reason, with the search of reason drive, turning that filter on actually stabilizes the clock so the time doesn't wander as much. So I uh, can upgrade the firmware on the drive. So the control board the drive comes with is universal across all the different horsepowers. And as ABB updates firmware and adds features, the control board, for the most part, has stayed the same throughout the lifespan of the 550. There's been a couple new control board designs that have come out. They have a feature where they add and something on the board has to change for that feature to come into place, but for the most part, the boards always stay the same and it's just a firmware upgrade if there's a new feature and you have an old drive that doesn't have it and you really need it on the installation. How do you do that? The firmware? That's uh, something we have, I got on my laptop, there's a uh, ABB rep down in Fife as well, custom controls, they're uh, what ABB calls a designated service provider, so those are ones that have access to the programs to upload the firmware, but it's just... You, if you uh, unplug the keypad on the drive, we have a cable from the laptop, plugs in where the keypad goes, and then you dump the firmware in. The whole process, start to finish, is like five minutes, so pretty quick. Uh, manufacturing, so New Berlin, that's our uh, primary U.S. headquarters for drive manufacturing. We also have uh, manufacturing in Finland, China, and India. <coughs> so uh, you'll see, especially the uh, smaller drives or the uh, little baby ACS320 drives, all those are going to be made in uh, China. Finland is where the big ones come out of, so especially if you got a big industrial drive or one of the larger horsepower 550 drives, you might get one that's made in uh, Finland instead of New Berlin. 
So uh, surge withstand. So this is something you're probably not going to be dealing with a whole lot if you're just working on the drive in the field. It goes more back to uh, selecting a drive to meet specs. But drive has a four MOVs head of the bridge. So it's a metal oxide varistor. If you hit the thing with enough voltage, it will send that voltage to ground rather than allowing it to continue on through the drive. So uh, they have a 120 joule rating. The input diode bridge on the drive is rated 1600 volts and uh, has a capacitor clamp as well. So that's all the uh, ratings in the drive that tell us how much of a surge the drive can withstand and still survive. Uh, current measurement on the drive, we actually use CTs inside the drive, so uh, the previous ones didn't do that. So uh, we've got a lot more accurate signal. It's not accurate enough for uh, charging customers. So we've had stuff like if you're running a drives in different areas and you want to be able to use that for official energy tracking and billing, it uh, doesn't meet the legal requirements for that, so it's accurate, but not accurate enough for uh, actually using it to charge people money. So uh, the drive will go down to uh, one-sixth of its rating. So you can take a 60-horsepower drive and run down to a 10-horsepower uh, motor on it. The drive will recognize the motor. It knows how to operate it, how to effectively protect it. Uh, you can also go uh, up above the drive rating, go up to 150%. So in that case, you're, you're not going to get any more out of the motor than what the drive is capable of giving it. So if you have, a, say, a 10-horsepower drive, you can put up to a 15-horsepower motor on it. You can program the drive for it so it knows what the 15-horsepower motor is, but you're not going to get any more than 10 horse out of it because that's all the power the drive is capable of pushing through to the motor. But uh, the drive will accept a motor larger than what it's actually rated for. So if you have an installation where... A motor is oversized based on some previous building design and you're never going to run it at full speed. You don't have to match the drive to that motor. You can actually undersize it if you know that's it's never going to need to run at full full power. So uh, you all rating have a uh, 100,000, they call it a uh, short circuit current rating. Here it says AIC, which isn't quite correct. That's uh, amp interrupt which uh, we're not interrupting, that'd be more of a circuit breaker rating, should be in that CCR there. But uh, drives rated up to 100,000 amps without <coughs> fuses. So there's some equipment out there that requires fuses to meet a rating. And, uh, these drives do not need to have anything in front of them to meet that rating. Uh, one uh, catch to that is if you have a bypass drive, the bypass has to be protected with the circuit breaker from ABB to carry that rating. If you get it with the disconnect, you uh, no longer have that rating. Here's our uh, control board. So if you pulled everything off of the drive, this is what you'd see in there. So the diode bridge, well, it's, it's under that. It's attached to the heat sink on the other side there. So you got the diode bridge coming in, our big capacitor bank. The uh, leads here are taking the DC voltage coming in from the uh, choke there and then back out through the output circuitry on the drive, which is going to be under that section there. So we've got a little tapper cooling fan up there. There's our CTs are measuring current on the output of the drive. We've got our MOVs up there for absorbing the uh, inrush. All right, so on the uh, drives, you can get them out of the uh, box. It, it doesn't have this little, whoops, back it up here, portion attached to it. That's what they call the conduit box. So if you're going to run conduit to a drive, you got to install the conduit box. So all the drives come with that shipped loose in the main carton there. So if you're installing the drive in a control panel, then that's where you don't need the conduit box. So that's why they make it optional. If you need it, you can install it if you're in a panel where it's already going to be closed, so it's out of people from out of the way of people being able to get their fingers on it, then conduit box isn't required there. So that's the uh, NEMA 1. NEMA 12, and I'll see if the next slide has the uh, full boxer. But the NEMA 12, that's the one where you got to keep water, dust, fibers in the air out of the drive. So we got this little flange that actually attaches around the drive. It's got a rubber gasket. The uh, cover on the front of the NEMA 12 has a gasket around it as well. So once you put that on the drive and tighten everything down, it's completely sealed from the outside world. Yeah, they're, they're skipping that. Well, I'll point it out when we come to it later. There's a NEMA 12, a few other spots in the sides here. Uh, you can also get the flange kit separate if you need to. So say you're doing a retrofit on a drive. It could be an ABB. It could be a different brand where the drive is mounted on a panel and the heat sink hangs out the back of it. That's a fairly common way to uh, mount a drive. You can get a, a flange kit for the 
550 base drive, and the flange mounts halfway through the drive, so the drive is sunk into that panel there, and its heat sink is out in the exposed air, even though the rest of the drive is protected inside the cabinet. All right, well, there's a little better picture of the gasket. It still won't show you the cover there. But there's the drive sitting there without the cover on the front of it, so there's this little gasket that goes all the way around. Yeah, nothing there. Okay, well, I'll point it out when it comes up again. So uh, the covers on the drive, they uh, got two different colors there. So we got the light white plastic that you're used to seeing when you walk up to the drive. So that's the indicator that you can take it off. It's made for field personnel to remove from the drive to gain access to control terminals, power terminals. The darker colored plastic is going to be a uh, kind of a dark gray like what you got on keypad there. That's uh, not intended for removal, at least for most field service, unless you're doing warranty work on the drive where ABB is actually authorized you to complete your tear the drive apart and get into the circuitry in there. But under normal circumstances, light colored plastic, you can do whatever you want with. The dark colored stuff is what needs to stay on there. All right, so some of this is kind of going back to the old drive, so like captive screw latching mechanism, no breakable tabs on the uh, Previous generation, which is the ACH 400, there are these two little plastic tabs that would line up the cover, and you hung it on the drive, and those had a tendency to snap off. So, uh, so don't have those anymore. There, that's kind of what that note's referring to. Got our option slot. Mentioned the relay module. Got Lawnworks. Uh, there's also a uh, 115 or 230 volt digital input interface card. So out of the box, the drive is set up to use 24 volts. DC, it's on its own power supply to switch those digital inputs on and off for start, stop, safety, whatever it is. If you have a control system that's running on line voltage, rather than having to add a bunch of interposing relays to make that work, you can order the interface card that will let the drive talk to a control system with line voltage controls. All right. Oh, yep, there's a dark plastic cover under the top there. All right. So here's all our uh, inputs, outputs on the control board here with the uh, cover taken off. So there's what you're going to see if you're actually working on the drive in the field. Just remove the cover in this case. So on the very top here, you got a couple dip switches. That will configure the drive for accepting either a 0 to 10 or a 4 to 20 signal. So your voltage or milliamps. Uh, if the switch is in the wrong spot, it won't damage anything, but your control signal will be all over the map. You won't be able to get it to scale correctly. So uh, make sure if you're configuring a drive, that switch is in the correct position. So uh, if you flip it to the left, that's for voltage. If it's flipped to the right, that's for current. If you actually have the uh, cover on the control board, there's a little indicator embossed on there, too, that points voltage and current left and right, so you know which way to flip that switch. So right below that switch, we got our uh, screen terminal. Typically, we never use that on the drive. So that would be the uh, shield for the control cable coming into the drive. Shield, you only want to land on one end. Usually that's always handled at the control panel end. So very rarely do you land the uh, shield at the drive. So uh, next terminals below that are two analog inputs. So typically that's where you're going to be uh, sending some kind of a speed signal into the drive. You could be using it to monitor some other sensor in the field as well. Then uh, next down we've got our two analog outputs. So that's uh, right through there. And then uh, now there's a 24 volt DC supply, so that's what we use to uh, switch the inputs on the drive. So voltage leaves the 24 volts, goes through some kind of a contact or relay that the controls contractor is controlling, then returns back to one of the inputs. So he closes his relay, that input gets voltage, the drive knows to turn on or whatever that input's doing. Uh, power supply rated at for 250 milliamps, so a quarter of an amp, so not a whole lot of power there. It's mostly just for running the uh, control logic in the drive. You can power up a transducer with that, but it's got to be within the 250 milliamp range that the drive is capable of producing. If you go beyond that, you'll end up drawing down the power supply and shutting down the controls on the drive. And we got uh, this uh, digital common ground. You can't really see it in the screen real well. The, the, out of the box, the drive's got no wires landed on there at all. To get the control logic to work, you have to jump or digital common to either ground or voltage. So the uh, reason ABB doesn't put that jumper in there is they're allowing you to pick what's going to be common. Typically, ground is our common, and we use voltage to turn our inputs on and off. If you set that jumper between uh, common and 24 volt, then you'd actually ground out each input to make it go active. So that's uh, why they give you the option, but with 8-track controls, I've never seen 
a grounds to activate an input. It's always voltage, so that jumper will always go between 11 and 12. We've got our uh, six digital inputs there. It's typically, our uh, it's going to be like your start, stop, safety circuit. If you got to interlock to make sure your drive doesn't try to ramp the fan up, the damper's closed, something like that. And uh, got our three onboard relays here. There's a little black plug there. Can't see it real well on the screen, but that's where the <coughs> relay module would plug in if you didn't, the extension. And then uh, this slot down here is where your comm module would plug in if you're going to use Bond Works, something like that. All right. Let's see if we got any new info here. Not a lot, so our external relay module. So it adds three additional relays. Uh, all the relays on the uh, on the drive itself and the module are rated for two amps. So it can't handle a lot of power, but uh, usually it's enough to handle like a damper actuator or something if you want to use the drive to pass power to an actuator to drive it open, something like that. So the uh, optional module, if you add that, you're going to get relays four through six. For default, you just have one through three. I have on and off delays available, so uh, that can be handy when you're using a relay if you want to make it wait before it turns on or have the thing wait before it turns off. We can put delays in there. No, just a few more details on our uh, line voltage control interface there. So it gives you the digital input one through six like you would have on the drive with the low voltage option, but in this case you're landing line voltage control to it. All right, more uh, more relay option module. There's a little uh, diagram of what it would look like if you actually had the uh, both modules in place. This is your uh, relay module on the drive, and then the long works or whatever your comm module would be plugging right below that. So you can't have both modules on there if you need to. They each have their own little slot they occupy. All right. Any questions so far? I'm sure I'm not skipping anyone here. All right. So uh, let's jump into uh, control here. So it's in a little more of the uh, programming side of things. So we have uh, on the 550 what we call the advanced control panel. This is the only control panel the 550 comes with. Uh, on the 320, and uh, they also have a 150 drive, which is even smaller than the 320. They have what's called a basic control panel. It's just a single line of display. So this screen there is about the third of the size. That's their basic panel. So that's why they call this the advanced panel. Uh, it comes with assistance, so if you're trying to get a drive started up, not quite sure what you're doing on it or which parameters you need to hit, the uh, drive has, well, it's probably a dozen or so different assistants on uh, how to configure it for certain things. So they got uh, it's like one for pump, one for setting up PID loop, one for using internal timers, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So you select that, activate the assistant, and it'll just start going through step by step asking you everything you're going to need to check to make sure the drive works correctly in that scenario. So uh, once you're familiar with the drive, you probably won't use an assistant because it, it takes a lot longer that way because it asks you a lot of questions you don't need to answer to make sure you don't miss anything. But uh, if you're not sure where to go, it's going to make sure you, you don't miss any steps on the way. So we've got a real-time clock. The biggest reason we have that, aside from uh, running the drive on its own time schedule, is if we have a fault, the drive will take a snapshot of that and tell us what time the fault occurred. So you can go back and figure out what's going on. So useful for troubleshooting there, provided you set the clock up when you do startup. So uh, if the clock isn't set, the drive will just give you the runtime in days. So if you had a fault on a drive without the clock being set, it might say this fault occurred at 1,065 runtime days, which is completely useless to anyone. That's its default if the clock hasn't been set up yet. So uh, I've got three lines of display here. You can make those three lines basically anything you want. So any function occurring inside the drive, you can pick out and put on the display. Uh, you can also rescale those functions. So Say you want to watch water pressure, you can take a 4 to 20 signal from a 0 to 50 PSI pressure transducer, run that into the drive, and then tell the drive, okay, I want to take this 4 to 20 milliamp signal and rescale it so I'm seeing 0 to 50 PSI on the keypad. So you can take any signal and rescale it as anything else you want. So they give you a lot of power to make it show whatever you want, but it also gives you the option to really screw it up because there's no safeguards in there to make sure you scaled everything correctly. So uh, something to keep in mind if you're coming up to a drive on a troubleshoot call and what you're seeing on the screen just doesn't match what the drive seems to be doing in the real world. It's possible the display wasn't set up correctly. 
So a dedicated help key on the right side there, the little question mark. If you hit that when you're in the uh, menu in the drive, it'll bring up a little description on uh, kind of how the parameter you're looking at works and some options on how to set it. So nowhere near in depth is the full user's manual, but if your manual's some flights of stairs down in your truck and you don't want to make the hike, that might be enough to give you the information you need to set the drive up. So also have a backup and restore. So a couple different benefits there. I mentioned one already where you can use that keypad to copy to other drives as well if you have multiple drives that are all programmed the same way. The other thing is if once you've got the drive working correctly, you back up the keypad, then if that drive fails in 10 years and nobody has any idea who programmed the drive or why they set it up the way they did, so long as that keypad's still there, you can plug it into the new drive, download it, and you're off and running. So a couple of different benefits there. Uh, changed parameters. So uh, that's another one that can help a lot in troubleshooting. It uh, gives us a list of everything that's been changed from the default. So if you're coming into a drive rather than trying to wade through 500 odd parameters and figure out what was changed, you can just go into those changed parameters and see right away who was where in the drive and what actually got changed. Has that always been there? Yes. Yeah, it's not a not necessarily advertised real well, but yeah, it is. It has always been there. <laughs> So, yes, it can get you up to speed a lot quicker if you're coming into <coughs> someone else's work and you have no idea what they did, but you don't want to wipe out the program and start over. That'll kind of give you an idea of what was dead, done ahead of time there. All right, so uh, kind of going through the control panel here. So got our handoff auto buttons. So they do just what they say they do, pretty self-explanatory there. Hand starts, off stops, auto puts the drive in auto mode. At that point, it's looking at the control system. So up and down arrow keys, uh, if you're in hand mode, up and down is what we use to control the speed on the drive. So you can ramp it up and down locally to control the speed of the drive if you want to have control. Uh, if you're in the menu system in the drive, then that's what we use to scroll through the menu and edit, change, parameter values. Uh, kind of a neat trick on these, if you are changing parameters in the drive and you need to get something back to default, if you hold the up and down key together at the same time, it'll jump back to the factory default. So it won't change it to the last known settings to so say the uh, like the current, say motor currents in the drive. The factory default was 10 amps, and someone changed it to 12 amps, and then you change it to 15, and you can't remember what it was before. If you do a little up-down arrow trick, you're going to go back to the factory default of 10 amps. So it's uh, taking you back to the factory default, but if that's where you want to go, it's a uh, quick way to get there. Uh, got our help button there mentioned already. So uh, up here we got our soft keys. They do whatever the little box, a text in the box above them says they do. So those two buttons will constantly change function as you're going through the menu system in the drive. It uh, they'll say menu one might become the enter button or the exit button or the edit or whatever it is. So depending where you are in the drive menu, those buttons will change function. So uh, this guy here, if you have a fault, that becomes your reset. Button. So this little box here, you'll see a reset on there, so you hit that to reset the fault. And, uh, kind of another uh, interesting side story on these, if you remember the old Nokia cell phones that had two little buttons on the top, kind of functioned the same way, that's where that idea came from. So not just coincidence, that was actually ABB they, you know, getting authorization. They have to go to Nokia and say, hey, we really like this idea, can we do this? And they got the rights to use that same concept of having two soft keys that change function on their keypad. So I've uh, got our uh, three display lines there, mentioned that already. In the top left corner, got a bicolor status LED. So this picture right now, it's green. It can also be red, and it can be either flashing or solid. So depending what it's doing there will tell us a few different things. Uh, I think the next slide will get a little more detail on that. So uh, the systems we have, a startup assistant, that's uh, what I mentioned already, so where the drive will take you step by step through setting it up for different scenarios. They also have uh, what ABB calls a maintenance assistant. Basically, that's a uh, maintenance reminder message you can set up on the drive to come up based on a certain runtime or a certain number of motor revolutions. So every million motor revolutions, you want this little message to pop up on the drive. So you could use it to remind someone to change filters in an air handler, whatever it is. Then. Uh, Last one, diagnostic assistant. The only way you can get to that is if there's an active fault on the drive. So 
If there's an active fault, your uh, left soft key that will say uh, reset. On the right, you'll see the letters D I A G, so short for diagnose, diagnostics. If you hit that, it'll actually give you a uh, little rundown on okay, this is what your fault is. Here's several possible causes and things to check. So uh, if you uh, got that fault, you hit reset, and oh, I wanted to go back, it's gone. You can't get to it again. The only way to access the diagnostic assistant is if you have an active fault. So startup assistant, I hit that already, not too much new there, for maintenance assistant. So yeah, so we got kilowatt hours, run hours, motor revolutions, cooling fan operations. So those are the uh, four variables that you can assign to this maintenance trigger and how much or you know, what quantity of whatever those values are do you want this message to trigger on. This gives you some options there. Could you go back one slide? Yes. <clears throat> The uh, maintenance assistant. Yeah. So if you're saying revolutions, mm -hmm. or if you were to grease that motor um, and the manufacturer said we want it after this many hours, I'm just trying to figure out how we put in there a little <coughs> to the grease motor, mm -hmm. and when we do grease the motor, and we reset it, does it start from our reset, or does it start from? You can yeah, you can reset it. So in the, the reset function is uh, any parameter in the drive that's resettable, like some kind of a counter, if it's kilowatt hours or whatever, when you look at it like you're going to edit it, if you do the up down arrow key, that's what resets back to zero. So yeah, you can uh, go into the it's, uh, parameter group 29 and you reset the counter that way. Thank you. Yep. Sounds like yeah, good question. <clears throat> pretty easy. You know, yeah, set it up yeah. every 2,000 hours or something. Yeah, and unfortunately, the one thing it doesn't do is you can't name the maintenance flag, so you can't make it say filter change or grease oh, bearings what or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I wish you could. Alarm, be nice. what does it say? Yeah, it just uh, puts up a maintenance required alarm, and yeah. you can set up yeah. one of the replacement flags. Required on it? Yeah, it's. Because I put a note next to it that says. Yeah. This means yeah. grease. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can tell. Yeah, every time you see the maintenance so alarm on the drive, that means. So go grease the bearings on the motor this drive is running. So and we actually uh, got more like there are a bunch of trainer drives too. So at least for the guys that are here, once we're done with the class, we can bust those out and we can look at that or anything else you can think of that you want to do with the drive. These trainer things are pretty cool. Yeah. So the uh, diagnostic assistant mentioned it's uh it's only there when you have an active fault. So it gives you suggestions on how to uh, troubleshoot the fault, whatever it happens to be. What, what was the letters that come up? Oh, D-I-A-G, so it's oh. short for diagnose or diagnostic, but that, that's all the room they got in that little box, you can't hear the full word there. All right, there we go, so there's uh, everything our little status LED can give us. So solid green, that's normal, that's what you want to see. Use drive, either it's running or it's ready to run. If you tell it to start, it's going to take off and start running. Uh, if you have a flashing green, that's uh, what ABB calls an alarm. And then uh, we also have a fault. So in ABB's world, an alarm is less critical than a fault. So I've heard, I don't remember what the other brand was. It was the Escalor, Down Foss, but someone, they, they flipped the nomenclature and fault was less critical than an alarm. So depending on uh, who you're talking to, it could mean different things. So to ABB, an alarm is less critical than a fault. You know, if you have an alarm, you'll have a flashing green light. The drive won't be running depending on the alarm, some drive, some uh, alarms that we can run through, some we can't. So uh, say we got a uh, open safety circuit, that would be an alarm in that case the drive would stop because your safety's open. If you have a mild overcurrent condition, say your motor full load current's 15 amps and we're pulling 16 amps, <clears throat> the drive isn't going to immediately trip out, but it'll put up an alarm on the display let you know, hey, we're going overcurrent. If you stay there long enough, then you will fault out. So depending on the alarm, we may be able to run, we may not. The alarm code will come up on the screen as well. So it'll alternate. You get a couple seconds on the home screen, then it'll come up and say alarm code 2021 or whatever it is, and then it'll go back to the home screen. It just keeps sitting there flashing back and forth. Uh, alarm is self-clearing. It doesn't leave any evidence behind that there ever was an alarm. So whereas a fault, it'll store it in the fault logger so you can go back and see, okay, we had a fault. Uh, 3.30 Tuesday afternoon, once the alarm condition goes away, it's just, it's gone. You'd never know it was there if you weren't there to see it happen. Uh, solid red, that's a fault. So that's something more critical to the drive. So it'd be like a uh, short to ground, maybe a phase to phase short, uh, critical, or a uh, 
high overcurrent, so rather than just a couple amps, you know, two, three times what the motor is rated for something. If you see this big current spike, the driver will immediately shut down to protect itself and the motor at that point. So once you got a fault, you got, this light's going to turn red, the drive will not be running, you have to reset the drive before it'll even attempt to restart. Uh, you can set the drive up to do auto restarts as well, so at that point it'll try to restart itself however many times you told it it's allowed to attempt, it still can't reset itself, <laughs> then it goes out on a permanent fault, and you still have to send a tech out to reset the fault. Then uh, the last one is a uh, flashing red. So flashing red, the only way you can even attempt to reset that is cycling power to the drive. There isn't a, a reset button to clear a flashing red fault. So uh, that's usually something went horribly wrong inside the drive. I don't think I've ever seen a drive with a flashing red fault where you cycle power and everything's okay and you're good to go. So usually if you got flashing red, that's uh, either rebuild or replace the drive. But if you want to try to reset it, cycling power is your only way to do that. So uh, faults and alarms, uh, the way the codes are lined up, any fault code is going to be from 1 to 1999. Alarm codes are going to be from 2000 to 2999. So if you're talking to someone on the phone and they say, hey, I got alarm code 1, then you know it's, well, it's not really an alarm, it's a fault. So based on the way ABB splits them out there, you know with the uh, numeric range immediately whether it really was an alarm or a fault. Uh, some of the more common faults we'll see, overcurrent, which uh, if it's an overcurrent fault, that was a much higher overcurrent than just kind of nibbling at the full load current on the motor. It had to be severe enough that the drive faulted out to protect itself or the motor. So uh, if you got something like that, we're probably looking for a short to ground somewhere or maybe the motor's jammed, you got a pump seize, something like that where the current is way outside the normal range for that motor. Uh, DC undervolt, you'll get a DC undervolt fault anytime the drive is trying to run, so if it's actively running and you cut power to it, we'll get a DC undervolt fault. If the drive is sitting idle and loses power, then it's just a controlled shutdown and it won't generate the fault. So uh, when you're looking in the fault logger, DC undervolt really common to see. That's, you can know, see just guys are doing maintenance or whatever and they don't stop the drive before cutting power to it. So uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong in the drive if you have a bunch of DC undervolt faults in there other than guys need to learn how to shut the drive down properly rather than just cutting power to it while it's running. Is that hard on a drive? To it's, it's not the best for it. It's, yeah. It's, uh, like I say, it's under load and all of a sudden you pull power to it. So it's going to try to ride through and recover through it if it thinks it's a brownout or something. Then eventually the thing dies because it loses voltage. So ideally you want to stop the drive first, then you shut down power to it. So a little easier on the drive circuitry and also uh, you're not generating a fault in the drive every time you shut it down like that. Uh, panel loss, that's a real common fault to get. Anytime the drive is running in hand mode, and you take the keypad away from it, it will fault out. If you're in auto mode, it doesn't trip out, because at that point, we're looking at the control system for control information. We're not looking at the keypad. So uh, this is also typically what I'll use if a controls contractor wants us to simulate a fault, so you know their fault relay is working put the drive in hand mode, take the keypad off, takes it a couple seconds to register, and then you'll get a fault. So you can actually generate a real-world fault. Uh, earth fault, last one we got up there. Uh, earth fault, the drive is looking for what it believes to be current leakage to ground. So uh, we can get those on the uh, nuisance level, depending on the installation. We can have situations where the drive thinks there was an earth fault where there really wasn't. So. Uh, drives within probably about the last year and a half, we have an adjustable sensitivity on the earth fault. So previous to that, ABB had a run of drives for probably a year or two where they boosted the sensitivity on the earth fault because they were trying to protect their drives so they wouldn't keep blowing drives up if they lost a uh, drive on a uh, short to ground somewhere. So it, it did work. They had a uh, lower failure rate, but the unintended consequence was they had a lot of nuisance stripping. So uh, their next fix was to come up with this adjustable earth fault. So out of the box, now the drive comes at its most sensitive point, but if you, you can back it off if you need to. So if you have a situation where a drive keeps tripping out on earth fault, disconnect the motor from the drive, measure it out, do all your due diligence, make sure there's no nicks in the wire or anything, and you can't find anything, then you can drop that sensitivity back a little bit so you still have earth fault protection, but you're not getting these nuisance trips. So that's actually an uh, example of a firmware update that we'd have as well. So a function where you can update the firmware on the drive and you have this new function that the older drives didn't have. 
Uh, going down to alarms, so overcurrent, real common alarm you'll want to see. So that's uh, not a severe overcurrent where it's pushing a little past the current on the uh, motor. Uh, one time you'll see that is if you're uh, trying to accelerate a load too quickly, the drive's drawing too much current to get that motor up to speed in the time you've given it, you'll go into an overcurrent alarm. So uh, in that case, you need to give the drive more time to accelerate. And uh, kind of on the flip side of that, over voltage, if you are uh, slowing the motor down, typically this is what you'd see on a large fan where you got a lot of rotating weight. If you try to bring it down to a stop too quickly, the fan's own weight will override what the drive can do to bring it down to a stop and the motor essentially becomes a generator, starts pushing voltage back into the drive and we go to an over voltage condition. So if you get a uh, over voltage alarm and deceleration, you need to give the fan more time to decelerate. So uh, that's uh, something when we're doing startup, that stuff will go through and <coughs> up and down and make sure we don't get either an over voltage or over current alarm on the ramp up, ramp down sequence. But if you run into that in the field, that's something to watch I out I have a for. question on that. Does yeah. it tell you on which one it's over amping, whether it's startup or shutting down? Uh, no, it'll always be, you'll over current will always be when you're ramping up, over voltage will always be when you're coming down. So yeah, just electrically the way things work out. You know, the voltage will always be on the deceleration side, current is be the acceleration side. So uh, this one here, that's probably the most common one we get. Start and able one missing. So that's uh, what ABB uses as a safety circuit. So another kind of thing to learn for the ABB nomenclature, start and able to ABB is a safety circuit. So a high static, be a free stat, something like that. Uh, out of the box, the drive is looking for the safety circuit to be completed to digital input four. So you either have to jump for that, land your safety circuit, or if you're not using a safety circuit, you can uh, go into the programming in the drive and just disable a safety so the drive quits looking for the circuit and you get rid of that alarm. But the uh, first time you power up a drive brand new out of the box, it's immediately going to give you this start enable one missing alarm. Then uh, 2025 first start. So the very first time the drive starts a motor, it will <coughs> sit there and magnetize the motor and look at the motor. It's testing it, making sure there's no shorts or imbalances in the phases and the windings in the motor, no current leaking to ground, and it's comparing the uh, feedback it's getting to make sure the motor looks like what you told the drive it was running. So if you program it for a 5-horse motor and actually wire it to a 10-horse, it'll fill that test when you try to do your first start. So I had a couple times where uh, customers are going to start the drive, they'd hit start and see an alarm, and they'd shut it off right away because if you're, something was wrong, it just went into alarm, and it was just trying to make it through the first start. So a first start gets triggered any time you change motor data. The drive will do a first start test once and then never again unless you change the motor data and then it'll retest the uh, motor based on the new motor data. So the first start test takes maybe 20 seconds. You'll see the, the motor be held stationary and the drive will just kind of sit there and make this little whining sound. And then when it completes the test, the motor will ramp up and start following whatever the speed reference is. All right. So firmware features, uh, get more into the uh, little more programming side. So uh, drive has short circuit and ground fault protection. So ground fault would be that earth fault detection we talked about earlier. So we also have the short circuit protection. So uh, you got short circuit and overcurrent protection required for a motor. So the drive provides all the protection a motor needs to have. We don't need any fuses or opler oats between the drive and the motor. Actually, really, you don't want anything between the drive and the motor. But uh, the drive is not required to have anything else to protect the motor. It meets all the NEC requirements for motor protection. Uh, drives up through 50 horsepower and 460 volt only have what they call the uh, wiring protection. So if you take the uh, line voltage and put it on the drive's output, it'll give you an alarm saying wiring fault, and so you know shut it down and move your power to the input side of the drive. So I, I'm not sure why they stopped at 50 horsepower on that, but that's as high as that function goes. So if you've got a 60 horsepower drive and put voltage into the outputs on the drive, then you get a lot of smoke and go buy a brand new drive. But uh, up to 50 horsepower, you're covered at least. So uh, macros, that is uh, pre-programmed user sets, or a pro 
control sets in the drive. So out of the box, the drive has what we call the HVAC default macro. So that's just how all the different inputs in the drive are programmed and how the drive's going to respond in a different situation. Oh, we also have hand control. We got internal timer. There's a uh, damper control, supply fan, cooling tower, a whole bunch of different macros. But it's just ABB making their best guess at how you'd probably program a drive in that situation. So typically, I just keep it in HVAC default and modify it from there because invariably, if you select the cooling tower macro for a cooling tower, it's probably still not exactly what you need, and you got to go back and change something anyways. So I find it easier to always use HVAC default, so I always have the same starting point, and then I just adjust the drive from there. But uh, in addition to those, we have what they call user one and two macros. So you can actually have two completely different separate programs in the drive under two different macros and tell the drive switch back and forth between which program it's using. So example I give you here is a summer mode and winter mode that uh, gives you the option to do that so you can completely change the drive's program on the fly if you want. So uh, RPM counters, that goes back to our preventive maintenance message, I already talked about that. Uh, PID function, so the drive does have a PID loop control in there, actually two different loops it can control off of. Not something we use real often. I see half a dozen or so a year where we actually program a PID loop in a drive. So uh, if you don't do a lot of control work, PID, probably the most common thing you've seen in our everyday life is cruise control on your car. So if you'd set it for 60 miles an hour, you start going up a hill, we got to apply more gas to maintain speed as you go up the hill. You go down the other side, you got to back off to make sure you don't go flying past 60. So same idea in the drive. You can set it to maintain a certain water temperature, air pressure, whatever you want. And, uh, the drive will ramp up and down to compensate for changes in the process, whatever it is, to make sure we stay within the set point. So uh, I've got two different loops you can use on that. Uh, analog outputs, those already. So uh, 0 to 20 milliamp output. It's programmed as a 4 to 20 milliamp output from the factory, which that would be your most common control signal. The uh, reason you would use 0 to 20 is if you want a voltage output. The way we get a voltage, you would scale that output there's 0 to 20, then you put a 500 ohm resistor across that output, and the result is 0 to 10 volts coming off of the output. So uh, unfortunately, they didn't put a dip switch in there, so you actually have to put a loose resistor across if you want a voltage output. But a uh, good little trick to be aware of if you got a situation where you have a control system that will only accept voltage inputs, then uh, we can get a voltage from the drive that way. All right, so uh, programming the drive. Uh, the way the menu structure is set up in an ABB drive, if you haven't spent time in them, we have what we call parameter groups. So the groups are uh, 1 through 99. Uh, not all groups are there. So the more basic drive you get into, the less parameter groups you'll see. Uh, the groups are kept the same between drives. So group 10 in the HVAC drive is going to be the same as group 10 in the industrial drive. The, the ACH 550 is missing quite a few different groups, whereas you get into the more advanced ABB drives, which would be on the industrial side, you start seeing those holes filled in, in the menu. So uh, parameter numbers, the way they're set up, the first two digits tell you which group the parameter is in, the second two digits tell you where in that group the parameter is. So example, here's parameter 1002, so you go to group 10, and then the second parameter within group 10 is parameter 1002. So pretty quick and easy way to find stuff. Uh, the menu is only two layers deep on the drive, so you just got your group and then your parameters within the group, so you don't have to go to any sub-levels beyond that. So uh, starting off with the uh, parameter groups here, uh, 99, if you actually look in the user's manual, that's where EPB starts as well. We call that startup data. That's where all the motor data is. So that's usually the first place you're going to go when you're programming a drive is at least get the motor data set up. you got a guy in the field and he has to run the drive before you're going to be on site to work on it. At least make sure they get the motor data and at that point the drive can protect the motor if it needs to and controls can be handled later. So uh, group 99 are putting in all the motor nameplate data, so nominal voltage, so that's coming off the motor nameplate. So it's not 480 volts, it's going to be 460 volts or might be 208, 230, but you're uh, not going to run across a motor that's a 480 volt motor on the nameplate. So make sure you put the uh, nameplate voltage in there of 460 because that will affect how the drive treats the motor and how fast it ramps voltage going to the motor. Uh, next one is current. Uh, also comes off the nameplate. Uh, don't use the service factor. 
So uh, some motor nameplates will actually specify that. Most of them don't. We'll see like a nameplate. You got your current. You got your service factor there. So uh, when we're programming the drive, we want the full load current without the service factor taken into account. Uh, nominal frequency is going to be 60 hertz, unless you got the motor that was like a European design or something, then it might be 50 hertz. That's uh, something we're taking off the nameplate as well, though. So it doesn't have anything to do with how fast you want to run the motor. It's just what is the nominal frequency of that motor design. Then uh, nominal speed, which is RPM. Oh, it's kind of redundant there because speed is RPM. So uh, getting the uh, nameplate RPM. The uh, main reason you want to get that plugged into the drive is because uh, some of the parameters in the drive will refer back to what the RPM of the motor is. So if you don't program that correctly, then the drive's calculation will be incorrect as well. So it'll be giving you inaccurate information there. So uh, starting back at the uh, beginning of the groups now, group one. Uh, oh, something else to mention too, uh, the group does wrap around. So if you're looking at group 99, if you hit the down arrow, it'll kick you all the way back up to group one, so you don't have to scroll all the way through the groups. Uh, group one operating data, that's a, a list of everything happening in the drive. So these are all uh, read-only parameters, the exception of uh, anything like a uh, energy tracking or something for kilowatt hours or motor revolutions. But other than that, it's just real-time data. So how fast is the drive running in RPM? You can get the uh, frequency, the torque, the DC bus voltage in there, the status of all your analog inputs, your digital inputs. It'll tell you which ones are on, which ones are off. So uh, real useful for uh, troubleshooting if the drive isn't responding to the control system the way you think it should. You can go into group one, and that will tell you from the drive's perspective what it's being told to do. And then from there, you can kind of isolate whether the drive is really even getting the control signal you think it is or not. Uh, group three actual signals, don't use that one a whole lot. It uh, gives the status of the drive in a hexadecimal. You've got to convert it from hex to binary, and then you can look in the manual. It tells you what all the bits in this binary word mean. So uh, not something we'll use real frequently. If anything, if you called ABB tech support, they might ask you to go into group three and tell you what was in there, and they can decode that on their end, and that'll get them up to speed a lot quicker on what's happening in the drive rather than having you go through all these different parameters and say, okay, what do you see here? What about this? What does the drive do when you do this? Uh, group 4, fault history. So that's one of two places to get the fault history. There's also something called the fault logger in the drive's main menu. So uh, kind of two ways to get to the same thing. But when the drive has a fault, it will uh, take a small snapshot of the most, three most recent faults. It'll tell you what the fault name was, the time it occurred, how fast the drive was going, frequency, voltage, current torque, and get your uh, DI status, and then uh, this status word down here, that's that hex number from uh, group three there. So your three most recent faults will have this whole list of everything that was going on when the drive faulted out. After that, your fourth fault on down through number 10 just starts getting bumped down the line, so you lose all that in-depth data. So uh, group 10, that's where our uh, start-stop control is from. So uh, something to kind of be aware of here, the, uh, we call it EXT1 and EXT2 commands. That is the start command on the drive. So they, we don't actually have something in the program that's called start and stop. It's called EXT1 commands or EXT2 commands. So uh, what that's referring to, EXT1 is one control set, so it has its own start, stop, and speed source. EXT2, if you wanted to, would be a separate start command in its own speed source. So you could have two different start, stop, and speed sources and have the drive switching back and forth between the two of them if you wanted to. Um, HVAC world, I don't think I've ever seen that done. You usually have a single start command, a single speed command, and that's what the drive follows. So uh, you have different start commands available. Typically, we'd either be using what we call a two wire. So you just have a pair of wires. You close the contact, the drive starts. You open it, the drive stops or uh, controlling it over uh, comm down here. We can also do a three wires. So you have a uh, start, stop, and reverse. You, there's an option to have momentary pulse rather than having to hold the start command. It's just you bump it and the drive starts, and then you can bump the stop and the drive stops. So uh, things you don't use as much from the HVAC controls, but those are a few of the options it has available for different start, stop options. Uh, the other thing you got in uh, group 10 is direction. So uh, direction of the drive, out of the box, it's locked to the forward direction. You can also set the drive to go in reverse if you want to change direction. And uh, you can, uh, your third option, there's what we call direction request. So in that 
one, if you uh, trigger an input on the drive, it tells it change direction. So it'll default to forward when you trigger that input. The drive slows down, stops, and reverses and ramps up the other way. So uh, something on uh, what we call flying start, you see that well, parameter group for start modes later. But flying start, the drive will try to match speed to whatever the motor is doing. Typically, that's something we'd use in a fan. A pump, if you release it, it's just going to stall in the water and stop, whereas a fan has the potential to be coasting in the breeze if there's air going over it. So uh, with flying start, the drive will detect the speed of the motor. It will engage to it at that speed and then ramp it up or down to wherever we want it to go. Uh, if you have your direction set to forward only, if your fan is running backwards or coasting backwards, I should say, the drive will not catch it going backwards because it's only allowed to look for the fan in the forward direction. So if you want to uh, be able to catch a fan if there's a potential for it to start spinning backwards, you need to set your direction to request. At that point, the drive has permission to reverse itself if it needs to to find the fan. Once it does, it will get it going forward and then that's the direction it will always default to. So. Uh, even in a situation where you would never give the drive the command to run in reverse, you'd still set your direction mode to request, and the drive can use that to give itself permission to go in reverse to find the fan if it needs to. So that's something the uh, user's manual, unfortunately, isn't real clear on, but uh, good to know if you're dealing with something where you got a fan that has a potential to get pulled backwards. So these next two groups, uh, 11 and 13, if you're using a hardwired <coughs> speed signal, you uh, use so, these two together to configure the analog right. value coming into the drive, and then you tell the drive what that analog signal <laughs> correlates to as far as how fast the drive should be going when it sees that signal ramp up and down. So uh, logically, it kind of makes sense to hit group 13 first. So uh, group 13, we're telling the drive what the expected analog signal is coming into the drive. So is it going to be 0 to 10 volts? Is it going to be 2 to 10 volts, 4 to 20 milliamps? So uh, depending on uh, what you set for your minimum and maximum values in there, we'll tell the drive, okay, this is the signal we're accepting is valid data. So say you set it for 20% uh, for your minimum, so it would be a 2 to 10 volt signal. Anything below 2 volts, the drive would just ignore it. wouldn't even accept it as being valid information. So uh, first thing, you'd, you'd set your analog, tell the drive what kind of analog signal we're working with. Once you got that, then group 11, in your reference select, you tell the drive, okay, minimum signal means 0 hertz, maximum signal means 60 hertz, or maybe it means 50 hertz, whatever it is. So okay. the uh, reference select, you're telling the drive how fast or slow it should be going based on the value of the signal coming into it. Uh, if your speed signal is going to be a uh, something coming over a communications network rather than an actual hardwired control signal with voltage or current, so just information over BACnet, something like that, then uh, group 13 no longer applies, but you would still have to go into group 11 and tell the drive, okay, at minimum speed signal from BACnet goes 0 hertz, at max speed signal from BACnet you should be going 60 hertz, or however it works out in your particular... Is that a percent of the analog input? Yeah, or it'll... Um, in uh, group 11, you're actually working in hertz or frequency. So uh, like your uh, reference max, that's how fast the drive is going to go based on the maximum analog signal. So if in group 13 you set the drive up so the maximum analog signal is going to be 8 volts, then when we see 8 volts, whatever your reference max is, is what the drive is going to run up to, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a little confusing to try to explain it. The, once, especially once, uh, if you're here in the local class, you can get out the trainer drives, and I can kind of show you how it works. It helps seeing it in application because we got two levels of scaling. Your first level is your analog signal, and then you take that and start scaling against that and telling the drive how much of that analog signal is going to apply to how much frequency band. Uh, group 14 relay outputs. So those relays, you can select one of uh, 47 different functions for making that relay turn on or off. So uh, don't have them all listed here, but that's going to be something in the drive like, is it faulted? Is it running? Is it ready to run? Uh, it could be if it's at hand off or auto status. So a whole list of different things there. But uh, those, that was three relays there. Uh, another one, uh, drive started. So that's typically what we use if you want to use the drive to command its own damper open. We'll uh, program a relay for what we call started. So as soon as the drive sees a start signal, that relay will close. And then the uh, 
drive will still have the interlock going back to the damper end switch, so the damper starts opening, but the drive isn't actually allowed to run until the end switch makes, and then it'll start the motor up. So uh, I got options four, five, and six. If you need uh, additional relays, we can add that with that little extra relay card there. And we'll go on. Uh, this pass-through function for serial communication is kind of cool. If you have a drive tied into a uh, serial communication, so again, like BACnet, Siemens FLN, whatever the protocol is, you can take control of those relays over that protocol and turn them on and off to control some totally different piece of equipment if you want. <coughs> so if you have a something else sitting next to the drive or you want to be able to command a damper on and off through the drive using a command through BACnet, you can uh, do it that way and use a relay to pass power through to the damper actuator. Uh, group 15 analog outputs, so that's where we uh, can uh, assign a function to our two analog outputs. So that's going to be any variable function inside the drive, so speed, current, torque, temperature, something where it's going to go up or down. You can assign that to one of the analog outputs on the drive, then monitor that signal remotely to monitor whatever that function happens to be. Uh, so I got that little uh, 500 ohm resistor trick down there. So if you need to convert one of those outputs to voltage rather than uh, current, put a 500 ohm resistor across the ground and analog output terminal and you'll get voltage out of it instead. Uh, can apply a time filter to it if you want to. Same thing for the analog inputs actually as well. Those have a time filter that can be turned on. So system controls group 16, that's where all of our uh, safeties interlocks are so uh, run enable typically we'd use for a damper end switch start enable that's what ABB considers to be a safety circuit so safety would be like your uh, a free stat high static something like that the difference between start enable and run enable it's kind of subtle uh, run enable will allow background relay logic to occur whereas start enable stops everything so it's it's a safety circuit something happened where we need to shut down the equipment. So uh, kind of going back to that example where you use the drive to command its own damper open, if you uh, tried to use uh, run enable, or I'm sorry, not run enable, if you try to use start enable as your damper end switch command, when you give the drive that started command, it'll never close that relay to tell the damper to start opening itself up. The <coughs> start enable's open, so everything stops. If you use run enable as your damper end switch function, then the only thing it does is keeps the drive from actually being able to spin the motor up. Other than that, everything else can happen in or, sequence. Or pump enable? Uh, pump or enable pump for, interlock? Uh, you could use it as an interlock, yeah. If you, uh, like you want to have like multiple drives to one motor or something like that, or one, one drive at a time, so if one's running, the other can't run. So, yeah, the, uh, actually, another thing mentioned on there, the start enable will generate an alarm, the run enable will not. So when start enable opens up, you get that start enable missing on the display. If your run enable is not satisfied, the drive won't start. The only indicator that gives you that the run enable isn't satisfied is, uh, I should have pointed out earlier, but in the top left corner of the keypad, it'll, it'll say hand off for auto. There's this little semicircle. When the motor's running, that girl will start going around chasing its tail. If you tell the drive to start when the run enable is not satisfied, that arrow will change to a dashed line instead of a solid line. So unless you know to look for it, you're, you wouldn't even see it happen. You could be standing in front of the drive and switch and you, you wouldn't notice it. So uh, that's the only way we know that the run enable hasn't been satisfied. Satisfied, you mean like a DI close? Yeah, yep, exactly. So, but that's something to keep in mind if you have the drive where you're telling it to start and there's no alarms, but the drive isn't starting, check that little arrow and see if it's a dashed line. If it is, then there's something in the drive program where it's looking for a run enable. Will it run in hand? No. Nope. Do yep, hand or auto. The run enable will disable both of those, which uh, actually is kind of nice if you're using it for like a uh, damper interlock. Like it, it protects it both. Yeah, yeah, so you can. You can't run the thing not in auto and then just come up in hand and run it anyways. So uh, we got we call uh, external faults. Uh, don't use those real often, but uh, that's uh, where you can program one of the digital inputs on the drive to make the drive go into a faulted state. So you can use some outside event to make the drive act like it just faulted out. So you can force the drive to shut down and it'll put a little external fault alarm on the display and someone has to come up and hit the reset to restart the drive again. So uh, if you have a situation like a safety circuit or something where you don't just want it to self-clear, but if once that safety trips, whatever it is, you want someone actually has to go up and look at the drive and manually reset it, 
you would uh, wire that to an external fault instead of just your start enable. I also got a parameter lock. So uh, if you got something like driving a parking garage or something, you don't want people going in and changing parameters on it, you can uh, set the parameter lock. Uh, the way the parameter lock works is once the parameters are locked, you can still get in the menu and look at parameters. It'll let you hit edit and change the parameter. As soon as you hit save, that's when it kicks you back out. So if you're going to uh, test it, if you think you locked the parameters and you go in and are trying to test it to see if you actually enabled the lock successfully, that's what you have to do. So you have to go all the way to the point of trying to change a parameter and save it before the lock will kick you back out again. Uh, Fireman's override. So uh, this is uh, if you want to set the drive up so it'll run just based off of the building commands in a certain situation. And if there's a fire, we'll go to a whole different uh, speed or operation mode that's uh, going to be programmed in group 17. So typically when we uh, set that up, it's going to have its own input. So when that gets triggered, the drive goes into override mode. And uh, you pick what speed the drive is going to go at. So you, use that for, you use that for evacuating refrigerant and chiller rooms, too. If you're using the drive for mm -hmm. exhaust just to, you know, you're maintaining pressure. And then if you had a leak, a refrigerant leak, the monitor sends you signal yeah, to that. And it goes, to high, uh, it goes to full speed and everything. Yeah starts evacuating. Yeah, so something like that, or uh, we'll see it in uh, like elevator pressurization fans, that kind of thing, to where you, you'll you you'll have it run at you know, a certain speed under normal conditions, and then if there's a fire, the fire department can come into the panel and say, okay, we've got this, this, and this fan in fire mode, and the drives go to whatever speed. And it overrides all the other functions? It does, yep. So and, uh, the other thing it does is it disables the keypad. So there will be an alarm on the keypad letting you know it's in override mode. But if you hit stop, hand off, auto, whatever you want, it, it's just going to keep running. It doesn't care what you do on the keypad. And then when the signal is not present? Then it reverts back to normal. Right. Yeah. So the uh, there is a uh, password you have to put in the drive to arm the override. So you, you can't do it by accident. They make sure you, you really want to have it enabled because once it takes off an override, you, you can't stop it shy of cutting power to it. All right, so uh, group 20, it's where we got a uh, limit. So uh, you got a minimum, maximum speed, or minimum and maximum frequency. So uh, what we have going on here, I uh, talked about the scalar and vector mode a little bit in the beginning of the class there. The drive out of the box is set up for scalar mode, which means we're running in frequency. In uh, frequency or scalar mode, you adjust your minimum and maximum frequency. If you're in vector mode, then you would adjust your minimum and maximum speed, which are in RPM. So when you're setting your limits, make sure you're setting the correct limit. If you got the drive set up for scalar mode and you go in and say, I want the minimum to be 450 RPM, it doesn't apply. The drive isn't even looking at that parameter. So uh, if you're in scalar, it's got to be frequency. If you're in vector, make sure you're setting the RPM for the minimum and maximum speed you want. So uh, rule of thumb, usually if we don't get any other uh, Minimum speed will set it to 15 hertz. So 15 is it's enough speed that you're kind of you can justify the drive is running at that point for moving air, water, whatever it is. Much below that, we're uh, really not doing enough work to justify having the drive running. Uh, I have seen that garage exhaust fans now where they're asking for us to go down to six hertz. So uh, provided the motor can handle that, we can take it all the way down to six hertz. The drive doesn't care, but you don't want to get in a situation where the drive is sitting there doing. Like running the motor at zero hertz, so it's not actually running, but it's energizing the motor, making sure it doesn't move. If, if you're scaling from a four to twenty, mm -hmm. that's your four is your start. So you said yours are zero to twenty. Do you have to do something with those zero from four, like set a percentage or something on that? Yeah. So if you're using a four to twenty speed signal, you would set your analog minimum to twenty percent, because four is twenty percent of twenty milliamps. Right. And at that point, anything below four milliamps, the drive just doesn't ignore or ignores it. It's like it's not even there. So uh, that's uh, it's different from uh, the group twenty limit. So that'd be uh, in your group 13 for your analog. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So yeah, in that case, if uh, so, say you had a uh, you had the drive set up for a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. If you send it 2 milliamps, 3 milliamps, it's going to treat it the same as 4 milliamps. As far as it's concerned, there's nothing there yet. And then as soon as you go to 4.1 milliamps, then it four picks is up the and new knows zero. There's something there. Yeah, at least for milliamps. All the negative bottom and suitcases and all the So max. So typically. Uh, the 15 hertz minimum you might see lower. Max frequency out of the box is 60 hertz. We can go higher. The drive can go just, well beyond 60 hertz. Let me need to. 
So uh, that's something especially you'll see a lot with uh, direct drive fans and those fan arrays. We'll take those little fans and they might spin those things at 90, 100 hertz. Uh, so long as you're not exceeding the current of either the drive or the uh, motor, that's uh, typically our uh, limiting factor. <coughs> At some point, you want to encounter the maximum RPM design of the fan, too, whatever that is. Uh, so but, uh, direct plug you can go well over 60 hertz yeah. if you have a situation yeah. where the drive needs to go over 60 yeah. hertz. Or uh, so you got a situation where either a pump or a fan isn't quite meeting the design flow you need, and you're still well below the full load current on that motor at 60. Go ahead and set it to 65, 70 hertz, see if that's enough to get you what you need. Uh, next one, max current. That uh, one kind of causes a lot of confusion. Max current in the drive is not for motor protection. So motor protection is all based on the full load current you put in group 99 when you're putting the motor data into the drive. Max current, really the only reason you're going to go in there is to derate the drive. So if we have a situation where it's a real hot environment or something like that, or uh, switching frequency, uh, see how a few parameters later, that's that DC switching, how fast the drive is switching, we can uh, boost that to make the drive quieter. Uh, when you do that, the drive has to work harder, it heats up faster, so you have to derate the drive. It's not allowed to operate at full output anymore. So that's really the only time you're going to go into the max current is to derate the drive to make sure it's not allowed to run past a certain level. But uh, don't, don't use it to protect the motor. If you do that, then say your motor full load current is 12 amps, and you put 12 amps in your max current, as we approach that 12 amps, the drive's going to start flashing this over current alarm to let you know you're getting ready to blow past your current alarm, and that's not what it's intended for. It's so constantly going to be an alarm. People will, some customers mm -hmm. will complain that drives make too much noise at low RPM, and mm -hmm. we, we were told not to do that. Just the, tell them to get over it. The switching speed. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the switching speed, you can it's hard increase on the motors, it. Isn't it? it. Yeah, it's uh, actually a couple more parameter groups out. Pretty sure I got in there. If not, I'll, I'll stop and hit it. But yeah, switching frequency, you can increase it to quiet the drive down, but it's less efficient and you are limited based on the drive size. So if we have something where you know you're going to want to run the drive at a real high switching frequency to keep it quiet, you have to oversize the drive ahead of time. So the. Uh, I think the D-rate on the 12 kilohertz, which is the highest we got, it's uh, like 60%. So you're, you're almost cutting the drive's capacity in half to run up that higher switching frequency. So there's a there's a big penalty there to do that, including the, uh, the loss carrier of energy. Is that efficiency. the same as carrier frequency? Or? Yep, yep. Is same that, does that show up as carrier frequency? Uh, ADP or? calls it switching frequency. Switching. Yep. Same thing, different yeah, manufacturers oh, yeah. use okay. different terms. But yep, identical thing, though. So... Uh, See what else we got here. Undervolt control. That's just either you uh, you can uh, set that. I think you can enable it. You can have a 500 millisecond active time or not on at all. So undervolt control. Kind of going back to where if you decelerate a fan too quick, you can get that over voltage rush where the motor sends voltage back into the drive. In the undervolt control, if the drive senses the voltage is dropping off, it can actually try to decelerate the fan to pull power off of the motor to keep itself. Energized, so it's not going to last real long. It depends how fast the fan is spinning, how heavy it is, but uh, might be enough to uh, get the drive to ride through a brownout or a power blip, something like that, so we don't completely shut down and have to restart and reset the uh, control sequence in the drive, whatever was happening there. So uh, that's that's what under bolt control does. Uh, there's torque limits in Group 20 as well. I don't think I've ever used them in HVAC. That'd be something more in the industrial world if you have a like conveyor belt or a hoist or something where you don't want to break something if you start forcing it. Where you don't really see that scenario in HVAC so much. So the uh, max, I think the default limit is 300% for max torque. So well outside of anything you're ever going to hit in HVAC. So typically you just leave that where it is and it stays out of the way. Uh, Start-stop mode is in uh, group 21, so uh, this isn't telling the drive what tells it to start, it's how it's going to engage to the motor when it starts or stops it. So that uh, flying start I was talking about where you need to set the drive to be allowed to run in reverse to catch that back spinning fan, this is where you'd set flying start in group 21. Uh, other options are auto, which at that point the drive starts from zero, so if the fan is coasting along at the equivalent of 20 hertz, if you do an auto start, it's going to try to start at zero hertz even though the fan is at 20 hertz equivalent, and you'll end up getting a uh, overcurrent alarm there, and the drive might be all right through, it might trip out. So really for fans, uh, flying start makes the most sense. That's how it comes set out of the box. Now we also have torque boost. 
or you can do uh, fly plus boost, which isn't in here. That's a combination of the two. So uh, torque boost mode, the drive will apply 100% torque to the motor, even though it's not moving. And it'll use that control method to uh, get the motor up to speed. So once it matches the uh, set point, whatever speed set point is, then we revert back to normal speed. Or I think if it's, let's say it's 15 or 20 hertz it exceeds, then it automatically turns off the torque boost function as well. Uh, DC mag, so what that does is tries to hold the motor stationary. So it's basically applying a brake to the motor. So instead of flying start, where we're trying to figure out how fast it's going and matching up to it, DC mag takes the other approach. And so I don't care how fast it's going, we're going to bring you to a stop so we know where it's at, and then we'll start it from zero. So uh, typically, most fans we're going to use flying start. It's kind of the more elegant solution. Stop functions, your two options are coast or ramp. So uh, fans usually coast is fine. So if you got a fan running and it's a uh, coast to stop mode, if you tell the drive stop, it just shuts off power to the motor and the fan can coast down in the airstream. So it doesn't really hurt anything there. Uh, on a pump, you want to use ramp. So on a pump, you just cut power to it. It's going to stop right away and you get all this water hammer through your system. If you set it to ramp, the drive will do a controlled deceleration back to zero before it cuts power to the motor. So uh, for fan, coast is fine for stop mode on the pump. Make sure you got it set to ramp so you eliminate water hammer when you shut it down. And then uh, also got a start delay in there. So if you have something where a function needs to occur before the drive starts, even though it's got that start command, you can put a few second delay in the drive before it actually will respond to your start command. So uh, XL D cell in uh, group 22. So those are uh, pretty straightforward there. So I'll mention that overcurrent or overvoltage alarm you can get. So if you're accelerating a load and you're getting that overcurrent, make sure you give the drive a little more time to accelerate. Uh, decelerating, if you're getting overvoltage, you need to give the drive more time to decelerate. So uh, there are uh, two different uh, ramp rates. The drive, by default, just looks at the first one. They have this parameter called XLD cell 1 slash 2 select. You can assign that to a digital input on the drive. When you turn that input on, the drive starts looking at the second ramp rate instead. That's uh, how that works, but typically we just use a single ramp rate for uh, most of the stuff we do in HVAC. Uh, next one, critical speeds, group 25. So uh, that is a uh, set of frequency ranges, or speed ranges if you're in vector mode, in the drive that you can uh, tell it to skip through. So if you have a uh, fan or a pump that just starts vibrating and hopping all over the place at a real specific speed range, we can go into the drive and tell it to skip past those ranges so it'll never allow the uh, motor to sit and operate in that range for any extended time. Only in vector, right? Uh, both, vector or uh, scalar. It'll work in either way. So uh, the way that works is, uh, say you got a, a real bad vibration in a fan between 25 and 30 hertz, so you, you put that limit in the critical speed. When the drive is ramping up, when it hits 25 hertz, it's going to sit there and wait until the speed command goes to 30 hertz, and then it'll pass through and continue on to the other side. So we can't just jump immediately from 25 to 30 and completely bypass that, but it'll I, make it, it its run through. It won't spend any more time in that range than it has to. And then the same thing when we're slowing back down again is we're decelerating. If we hit the top end of one of those limits, the drive will stay at that point until the set point goes to the lower end of that limit, and then it'll pass through and catch up and start following the speed set point right. again. We got up to uh, three different speed ranges you can lock out. If you just want to use one, then the ranges you're not using, you just leave your minimum and maximum set to zero, and it basically becomes non-effective at that point. Then the motor control, group 26. So this is where the uh, switching frequency is you're talking okay. about. So uh, start with flux optimization. That's the uh, first parameter in group 26. So what flux optimization does, uh, out of the box it is enabled. The drive will uh, look at how much torque is being required to spin the motor, and it will apply the appropriate amount of voltage for that required torque. So if we, uh, if we don't need 100% torque for a given load, whether it's a fan or a pump, whatever it is, the drive will detect that and it'll back the voltage off accordingly and you're saving energy so you're not and wasting you all this power generating torque that the motor isn't actually using. You're just draining in the heat at that point. So uh, flux optimization typically will uh, keep that on if you have a situation where the drive is struggling to uh, control a motor or speed's kind of oscillating a little bit. Try uh, turning the optimization off There's situations where uh, the uh, logic for that can kind of get confused and how much voltage should be there and uh, 
have control issues there. But uh, it's enabled by default. That's the most efficient mode to run it in. If, it, if it's working for you, usually it's fine. Our uh, volts uh, hertz curve, I think in the uh, drive mode, they call it the U slash F ratio. So U is the designator for voltage, then F for frequency. So uh, basically what they're saying there is at a given frequency, how much of voltage is being applied to the motor. So it makes sense that higher frequency goes, faster motors going. So the more voltage we need to keep up with to provide the right amount of torque. But uh, depending on the load, a uh, variable torque load like a uh, fan or a pump, something where as you slow it down, the power requirement goes down as well, that follows what we call a uh, squared volts to hertz curve. So that's how the drive comes set up out of the box because these are the HVAC marketed drives. So it's probably going to be on a pump or a fan. So uh, something that'd be a uh, constant torque load would be like a, uh, say, a conveyor belt or a hoist somewhere. And you got two tons of rock on a conveyor belt. Doesn't matter if you're moving at three feet a minute or ten feet a minute. It's still two tons of rock. The load hasn't changed there. So in that case, you'd run in what we call the linear mode, which produces full torque across the full range of the the uh, drive speed. No, that's actually what the drive is doing as well in that uh, torque boost mode. When we uh, select torque boost for that start mode, it goes out of squared and jumps into the linear ratio to apply full torque until we get up to speed, and then it reverts back to squared if that's how the drive is set up. So switching frequency, you got 148 and uh, 12 kilohertz. Out of the box, we're set to 4 kilohertz. That tends to be the uh, most efficient, so that's why it's set up that way. Uh, one kilohertz is uh, doesn't control the motor as well. You're almost putting too much time gap in the uh, signal going out to the motor, so it starts getting running a little more rough. Uh, to go up to eight or twelve, then we start sacrificing efficiency because the drive is switching a lot quicker on its outputs to create that pulse signal to the uh, motor there. So the benefit that we most uh, commonly associate with that is the higher switching frequency gets higher pitch, so it's harder to hear. So you have something like in a classroom or a library, you got to drive above a drop ceiling. People are complaining about hearing this whining noise. You can uh, put up to a higher switching frequency, but you have to keep in mind there's a D rate that comes into play as well. So uh, if you, the drive isn't sized correctly for that, you can end up going out on over temp alarms and causing all kinds of nuisance trips there. What about floating bearings on that setting? The uh, bearings... Boy, it's, it's, it's hard on the windings. I guess the bearings it could be as well. So as you go up to higher switching frequency, you are, you're hitting it with more pulses per second. So the, the bearing issues has more to do with a, uh, we call a uh, common mode current. And uh, I don't, I got a whiteboard here. Can you see the whiteboard on the, oh yeah, back there? Okay. So I don't know if I need it yet. Anyways, the, uh, on the drive, let's see if I got, can this work? That works. Okay. I'll do some lousy artwork here. So on a true uh, three-phase sine wave, this won't be exactly correct, but to your point there. So you got your A phase and your B phase. That's terrible. <laughs> your C phase. It's good enough. Yeah, it's good enough. But any any vertical point, so say right here, you got a, a positive wave, a positive wave, and then way down here, you got a negative. So those all come out to zero volts or somewhere close to it. So when you can go over... Well, I can't go over there because it's all the way there, but yeah, go down here, you got two negative, two negative, this guy continued up, way up there you got a positive. So the sum total of all three of those is zero volts, or should be somewhere close to that. On a VFD, since we're coming off of a DC power supply, we don't have three varying voltages that constantly <coughs> neutralize each other out. You have two legs that are at 650 volts positive and one that's negative, or two that are negative and one that's positive, so there's this leftover high frequency noise in the motor, which we call common mode current, that leftover noise is trying to get back to the source, which is ultimately the drive, but if it can't make it to the drive through the uh, grounding system, then it'll energize the uh, rotor and the motor. Once the voltage builds up enough that the oil film and the bearing no longer insulates against it, then it jumps across that film and you get an arc in the bearing and then goes through the motor shaft and the ground in building that way. So uh, that common mode, that's what's getting left over at the motor when the drive is running, and that extra energy, if it can't get to the drive effectively, it's going to use whatever path it can. So that, that's what's taking the bearings out. So uh, I got a uh, another section later today that kind of goes in a little more depth into that. But cool, that's, 
it's less than no, switch, switching frequency or speed per se, more just the fact that it's a pulse width modulated signal coming off of either a positive or negative, and we're trying to take two possibilities and evenly split it across three phases, which doesn't mathematically work out. So that's our what we have left over. You're going to get into that. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'll hit that. Got another section for that later. So hit a little more. It's where we chase our tail. That's all. Some switching frequency and uh, drive cloud. So yeah. Tell, oh, I'm going to go eight. And yeah. Then, and Baron go out later. Yeah, so the, uh, the switching frequency, what it is uh, definitely harder on is the uh, windings in the motor. So because as you're, uh, you're, uh, you're sending power to the motor, you send your switching frequency up higher and higher, it's that many more times per second the motor is getting hit with these voltage pulses. So that's uh, actually another thing we'll uh, hit as well in that uh, other section there, but we can uh, get this voltage doubling effect with the pulses going out to the motor. They reflect back to the drive, and if the timing is correct, the pulse leaving the drive can match with the one coming back from the motor, and it'll double at the motor terminals. So uh, if you have a motor that's not rated to be ran on a drive, then that double voltage is enough to start breaking down the insulation. If you're doing that at a higher switching frequency, it's getting hit with those that many more times per second, and we'll break it down that much faster. So uh, if you are going to try to use a, a higher switching frequency, there is something called a switching frequency control. And uh, if you enable that, the drive will automatically back switching frequency down to uh, control its temperature. So if it's overheating at 12 kilohertz, it'll drop itself back to 8 or 4 kilohertz to try to cool itself down again. Once it gets its temperature under control, then it allows it to uh, run back up to the 8 or 12, whatever you have it programmed to. But it kind of defeats the purpose if you're doing it for noise mitigation if the thing keeps overheating and going back down to 4 kilohertz where you have the problem. So uh, group 34, it's a display function, so that's uh, where we get to pick those three lines of display on the keypad. You can configure them to basically display any function in the drive that's occurring, and you rescale it to anything else you want. So I uh, mentioned earlier there's nothing in the drive to keep you from incorrectly configuring the display. So you could take a 4 to 20 signal and set it up for 5 to 18 degrees Celsius or something. That just makes absolutely no sense. So there's a... Uh, it's completely dependent on whoever set the drive up to know why they're programming the display for showing what they are, especially if they're doing something where they're taking a signal from a transducer in the field. They need to know the range of that transducer, how it was scaled coming into the drive, so the signal the drive is seeing is accurately displayed on the keypad. So time clock from 36, uh, one we don't use a whole lot, but if you've got a situation where the drive is in a standalone environment, there's no control system telling it when to start, when to stop, we can actually set up a uh, time schedule in the drive and have it start and stop based on any time of day. So you can have it run different times during the weekdays, and it might shut down during the weekend, or just have a different schedule on the weekend. Uh, logically, if you uh, go through all the different uh, time functions and build out the schedule as far as you can in the drive. The longest schedule we can do is two weeks, and then it has to repeat itself. So typically, you're on a weekly schedule, so that doesn't become a problem. But uh, two weeks is the absolute longest unique schedule you can put in the drive, and then you're starting over again. So uh, you can also uh, set the relays to uh, run off the timer as well, so rather than just starting and stopping the drive, if you want the relay to open and close based on that timer and some other function to occur, you can uh, do that as well. We've got our little uh, note down there, if you are using the time clock, make sure you uh, enable your uh, RFI filter on the drive and that'll uh, help keep the clock from wandering quite so much over time. So PID control, uh, that's one that's uh, really hard to demonstrate unless you're actually in the field where you have some variable with the transducer feeding back so you can show how the drive responds to it. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like cruise control in your car. You have some set point you can set in the drive and then it'll ramp itself up or down as needed to maintain that set point in the process you're using. So typically you're going to be doing like air, water pressure, flow, something like that. So a little bit of a learning curve to uh, setting up a PID loop because you can uh, change the variables on uh, how quickly the drive will respond to a change if it sees that it's starting to fall behind or get ahead, and uh, not only how quickly it will respond, but how aggressive that response is. So uh, a few different uh, variables there we can use to tune in the response. So if you have the drive responding too quick, you'll keep 
overshooting, undershooting. If it's too slow, then it's not doing its job. It's never actually hitting the set point. So it uh, takes a little bit of practice to uh, learn how to tune the loop. So there's a lot of material out there and different methods and ideas on most effective ways to get a loop tuned. So uh, the, uh, I don't think I have any slides here, but ABD does have a little cheat sheet on how to get you close. So it won't be perfect for every application but if you're on a booster pump or something like that. They have a parameter at least to get you started so you're in the ballpark and then you can fine tune the loop from there. Uh, this external PID loop, group 42, this is actually one we use to uh, control analog output on the drive. So we're not ramping the drive speed up and down, it ramps that analog output up and down to tell some other device what to do. So it's still PID control, but we might be controlling a uh, actuator for flow control on a valve or something like that. So that's uh, one I've never personally used. I've been the PID control a few times, but never actually had that something where I was controlling another device off of the drive. But if you have a scenario where you need a PID controller for a device and there happens to be a drive nearby, the drive can actually operate the logic to control that device on a PID loop. Oh, what? So, yeah. <laughs> so just sit there and basically it's acting like a PLC for whatever that device is. So it has nothing to do with the operation of the drive. It's just making itself available to do all the logic for you and spits out the value to ramp up or down for whatever the device is. Uh, group 53, embedded field bus. This is where we would uh, program the uh, communications address, baud rate on the drive. You're going to put the drive on uh, BACnet, FLN, whatever your protocol happens to be. So before you do that, you got to go to group 98 and select your protocol. So that's uh, set your protocol first. That will configure group 53 so it applies to whatever that protocol is. So if you go into group 53 first and put in your address and baud rate and everything, and then you go to group 98 and turn it on the BACnet, 53 just got wiped out. You got to go back to 53 and set it up again. So group 98 first, set your protocol, then you go into 53, and this is where you uh, set up all the specifics for that protocol. So uh, once you got that set up, this is also where you can go into the drive. It has a uh, OK message counter or an error counter, so you can verify if the drive is actually talking on the network or not. So a good troubleshooting tool there. Uh, with BACnet MSTP, we also can uh, look in parameter 5316 and uh, see the uh, token going around in the network. Well, that's uh, something unique to uh, the way the BACnet MSTP protocol works. But uh, if you have a drive on a BACnet network, you look at that token counter, that number should be constantly increasing. If it's not, then the drive doesn't even know the network's there. So uh, another good troubleshooting tool. So 98, here's our uh, protocol selection. We got our BACnet MSTP, uh, the Siemens FLN protocol, Johnson's N2, and then uh, Modbus. You can also add Longworks, uh, Ethernet, ViceNet, uh, Profibus. I don't, I don't know it's available on an HVAC drive. It's a uh, industrial protocol, but I don't think you'll ever run into a uh, building being controlled on Profibus. Anyways, that's uh, more of an industrial protocol. She so is uh, ViceNet. But those all program on, or uh, program plugin to the uh, drive module under the little cover there. So uh, last option for programming the drive is a program called Drive Window Lite. So you can actually uh, plug into the drive through your laptop, see all the parameters, change things, start and stop the drive. Uh, you can trend functions in the drive. So if you're doing troubleshooting or something like that, or you're going to do energy tracking, you can look at uh, different functions in the drive and trend them. So don't use that as much now, because most buildings have full control systems where they can do all this trending already. Probably the biggest thing I'll do with the uh, drive window light nowadays is if I have a customer where they want to have their own copy of the program, we can go into the drive, get the program, <coughs> save it to the laptop, and give them the program on a thumb drive where you can actually print it to a PDF, too. If they want to see it written out in words, you can give them this nine-page document on how every single parameter is set in their drive. <coughs> So uh, connecting to it, it's a uh, the plug from the drive. It's a little RJ45 connector, so what you see on the end of a Cat5 cable, and goes to a, a DV9, which is a serial port. So uh, most laptops nowadays don't come with a serial port anymore, so you end up getting a USB to serial converter as well to uh, make it work. So you got a little adapter between the ABB cable and your laptop to be able to talk to it. All right, so that. Uh, is the first half. So any uh, questions on stuff we hit so far? 
Well then, all right. So you want to take a break? Or, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Next section. Probably about that long. Round number two. Yeah. Let's see what we're doing. And over. Jesus. Well, you know that guy knows his business by the way he rambles on, like some of the stuff. <laughs> Here, I'll try to move pretty quick on this one. So, this year has a little more to do with the perspective of selecting a drive than if you're just walking up the one that's already out there. But just coming through uh, kind of the options on, you know, we got what we call the base drive here. It's just drive by itself, nothing added. So, uh, just put sure all the different enclosure options uh, under the hood options and get for the drive. You want to have it bypass, you know, different uh, bypass configurations. So, standard, you got your. Uh, Keypad, conduit box, you can get your uh, user's manual, comes on a CD. It used to be hard copy, you don't get that anymore. And your uh, IOM manual is still printed. Oh, so they went into shutdown? So uh, yeah. options, you right, hit these up earlier so you can get that no, relay out this module. If you want to go oh, from three to six relays, okay. got your uh, client voltage time. control interface. Okay. Then uh, what we call the R type field yeah. bus adapter <laughs> options. So field bus adapter, that's going to be like long yeah. works. Device industrial. Long works mostly what we're going to be using, maybe uh, back to IP. USD, but uh, the R type is uh, used on the VFD. And we have a bypass as well. The bypass can has it, have its own options modules. Those are the uh, F type modules. So uh, the two look very similar, but they are not interchangeable. So if you have a VFD by itself, you want the R type module. If you have a bypass, you need to make sure you order the F type module. So the flash mount kit, uh, talked about that a little earlier. Uh, remote control or remote panel mounted kit. Out there. Uh, so if you want the uh, keypad mounted somewhere off of the drive, the connection between the keypad and the drive is just a standard Cat5 cable. There's nothing proprietary about it at all. You want to go down to the local store, grab the Cat5 cable, plug it into each end, and you got your keypad 10 feet away from your drive. Uh, the uh, kit, though, has a little plastic bezel, so you can actually inset it in a uh, control panel door or something like that, and the keypad will pop in and out, kind of like what it does in the VFD. So a uh, little nicer way to do it. It gives you the option to pop it out if you want to carry it over to some other drive if you're doing upload-download work. But, uh, you don't have to. You can just screw the keypad yeah. to a panel as well. It's got studs in the back where you can uh, use a network number three screw to mount the keypad to something. But nothing special about the cable. So I actually carry a, a little cable around with me. So if you're under a situation where you got a drive that's kind of in an awkward area, rather than trying to reach up and stand on your head, they program the thing so you can see the keypad just plug in the cable and stand where you're comfortable and hit all your buttons from there. Yeah. Like, like, so base drives do not include uh, input fuses, a circuit breaker, disconnect, or a bypass, because that would be called a bypass drive. And uh, they're not compatible with the oh. F-type adapters. So if that already, if you got a bypass, that's where your F-type adapter would come into play. So uh, breaking down the model number on the uh, drives, once you know how the model number is uh, written out, it's actually uh, pretty easy to tell exactly what kind of drive you got. So if someone's in the field saying, hey, I'm working on this drive, you can ask them, OK, what's the model number? And they give you the model, and you know pretty quick what they got. So uh, going down the line here, uh, ACH 550, that's just the basic drive, so it's always going to start with ACH 550, unless it's an ACS 550. But for purposes of this, we'll assume we're looking at an ACH 550. The uh, next letters, either two or three letters there, will tell us what configuration it, it, it's in. So UH is the base drive. It's a US HVAC drive. So if it's a UH, they're just the bare bones drive. There's nothing else added to it. Then down below here, we got all these other options. So a B. C U D D R. If you uh, if you see a B, that's a box style bypass. So the bypass circuitry is sitting next to the drive. So if you got a B C R or a B D R, it tells you right away, okay, we got a box style bypass. The second letter, either C or D, tells us what the disconnecting means there. So if it's a C, it's a circuit breaker. If it's a D, it's a disconnect. So disconnect meaning it's just a switch. It opens and closes. There's no overload of protection there. Uh, P C R. P is a packaged drive, so packaged just means we've added a disconnecting device. So you'll have the drive and some disconnect sitting below it. So since the uh, box style bypass, if it's a PCR, it's a circuit breaker, PDR, it's a disconnect. Then the last one, the uh, Bs, that's a vertical bypass. 
So uh, for those ones, you got the bypass circuitry <laughs> sitting below the drive. So it's this tall, skinny unit. And the same thing for the C and D, telling you whether it's a circuit breaker or disconnect. Uh, the R series here is just a uh, series code. I believe it's, uh, if you use a couple different letters, I think the R for this one is Redwood. So it was the series code ABB used for the generation of drive. Uh, previous to uh, the modern day bypass we have now, you would have had a, a BD or a BC or a BD or a VD. So if you have a, a bypass and it doesn't have that R after it, it tells us that you have the older style E bypass instead of the newer version, which we call the Eclipse bypass. So uh, anything now with that R after it's a modern day one, if it doesn't have the R, it tells you it's a early <coughs> generation. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's the uh, configuration letters. Next number tells you the current output capacity of the drive. So uh, if you see the letter A there, that's like a decimal point. So a uh, 06 A9 is a 6.9 amp. But uh, that number there is going to tell you the output capacity of drive. And then the uh, last number, there's going to be a dash 246. That's the drive's voltage rating. So dash 2 is our 208, 240 drive. The 4 is a 480. The 6 would be our 575, 600 volt drives. So that uh, little string of numbers there, if you have those down, someone can just rattle off the model number and you know exactly what they're looking at. And uh, after that, we have the uh, possibility of having what we call plus codes. So that's a modifier in addition to whatever else you just looked at. So uh, plus codes, probably the most common one you're going to run to is a uh, enclosure. So uh, the uh, NEMA Type 12, that's going to be this V055. If it's the 3R, that's going to be the V058. So NEMA 3R, that's when you can sit outside to your outdoor enclosure. Uh, line reactor, the V213. Service switch, that's a uh, disconnect just for the drive. So if you have a bypass, the service switch will cut power to the drive. So you could disconnect it, take it off, and keep the bypass energized and operating if you have a critical facility where you cannot shut this thing down and take the drive off of it. So uh, that's what the service switch accomplishes. Then uh, the K series codes are all field bus adapters. So if you see a plus K something, that tells us there's an additional COM module added to the drive there. And I don't, yeah, we don't have serial number. Let's see. Well, I'll go back. I'll do more artwork here real quick. So serial number is going to be 10 digits. So first digit is going to be the you know, location is made in. So we're all, all our stuff is going to be starting with a 2. And then uh, next two digits are the uh, week, the week of the year it was made in. So that's going to be your thing from a 200 to a 252. Then you got your next, I think about it is, I think there's a uh, another series code somewhere in there. We got 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8. And then the last four are the drive's product run. So uh, these two, it's the second and third one. Those tell you the week, of, or the, the year rather, I'm sorry. I'm to think about it now. You just a full number up here. Let's see. So the, uh, yeah, these two are the year, rather. So the uh, first two are the year, so that's going to be like, if it's a 216, then it was made in 2016. So the two doesn't have anything to do with 2016. So you, you can throw out the first digit. But the uh, second and third are going to be the year it was made. The fourth and fifth will be the, uh, the week of the year. So that's where you're going to have your 00 up to 52. And then the last ones tell you specifically which drive that was that came off the assembly line in that week. So uh, with the serial number, you know exactly how old the drive is as well. So it's all embedded within the serial number there. All right, so this is just a whole list of a bunch of different uh, model numbers on the different voltage ranges there. So the uh, main thing I'd have you notice there, they got what they call the frame sizes. So R1, R2, 3, 4, 5, up through 8. So the uh, sizes on the drives, you see R1, we're up what, 1 through 7.5 horsepower. So the, there's a few different frame sizes, and there's multiple horsepower ranges within each frame size. There's a few more of them there. So there we go. There's our uh, actual graph of kind of what they look like going up through the size. So we go up through R6, and then the, the big guys are R8. So that's our 250 up through 550 horsepower. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of those in HVAC. There's, there's a couple of them out there, but not too many. But it used to be what we called a uh, R7, which was also a four standing model, a little smaller than the R6. That was only a 200 horse drive. They essentially figured out how to condense that down into the uh, R6. So 
the R7 no longer is made. There's a couple R7s yeah. that I know of in the Seattle yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Not, a, not a lot of them. So chances are if you run into anything floor standing now, it's going to be that big R8. So uh, our circuit breaker disconnect, uh, kind of hit those already. So if you see the C, it tells you that drive, whatever it is, comes with the circuit breaker. If you got the D, then it's going to be a uh, disconnect. Anything with the uh, input disconnect, ABB will add additional fusing on top of it. It's not a fuse disconnect <laughs> itself, but you'll have your disconnect and then the fuse will operate from three fuses protecting the uh, drive. I tried to it already. Uh, circuit breaker. So uh, if you got a circuit breaker, typically it doesn't mean you need input fuses. Unless you get to a frame size R5 and above, then ABB will include fuses as well. So the uh, reason for that's just eliminating collateral damage. So that was kind of the size they picked. Like, to, uh, 75 horsepower and larger. So if the drive that big has a dead short, there's more concern that it could take out upstream overcurrent protection and it'll shut down a whole panel somewhere. So uh, R5 frames and higher, if you order it with a circuit breaker, ABB will also include a fast flow fuses there to take the drive out of the circuit more quickly than a breaker would if something goes wrong in the drive. So more model numbers. These are the PDRs now. Here's our PCRs. So really nothing changing other than just those three letters in the middle there. All right, so there's a uh, picture of our uh, UL Type 1, UL Type 12. So in this case, we got the uh, disconnect down there on the bottom. So don't know if it's a circuit breaker or a disconnect, but got a handle there. So there's something behind the cover. Uh, something else to note, haven't mentioned, the uh, enclosure types, the ABB calls them a UL Type 1 or 12 or 3 or whatever it is, rather than the NEMA letters. Uh, what that actually means, the uh, rating for that enclosure had to be signed off by underwriters' laboratories. So a lot of the enclosures can just be self-certifying. So if there's a product out there, it doesn't have to be a VFD, it could be anything. If it's just a NEMA 12 enclosure, that doesn't mean UL said it was a NEMA 12. It just means the manufacturer said, well, here's what a NEMA 12 enclosure is supposed to protect it against. So we decide this is good enough to be NEMA 12. So uh, in ABB's case, they have actually gone through UL and gotten all their enclosures listed by UL to meet the criteria as well. So it uh, costs them a little more, but gives the end user a guarantee that it's not just the manufacturer saying, yeah, this is good enough. Underwriters Laboratories tested all their enclosures to say, yes, we agree that this actually does meet NEMA 12 or NEMA 3R requirements. So uh, something to watch out for looking at different drives or equipment in general, whether it's UL listed enclosure or if it's just a generic NEMA enclosure name. So, uh, down here, so that's our uh, it's kind of fuzzy. It's probably really fuzzy on the remote viewers, but this is the circuit breaker option. Uh, if you had it with the uh, disconnect, then you just be able to disconnect switch and the fuse block right above that. And then uh, this is our 12 suit. So it's completely sealed. You got that little rubber gasket behind it. You can kind of see a dark line. This is a transparent plastic door. So when you close that, it's got a rubber seal around that as well to meet the NEMA 12 requirements. All right. If there's anything new here, just going over the vertical bypass. I'm going to repeat stuff there, all our model numbers. There's our vertical bypass. So. That's what the vertical looks like. Here's our uh, vertical with the cover taken off. So depending on the job, the, uh, the vertical is going to be a little bit cheaper. You can fit more of them in a smaller area because they're tall, skinny drives. The side-by-side uh, -side is a steel cabinet, whereas the vertical covers are plastic. So obviously, it's going to cost ABB a lot less to make the plastic vertical enclosure versus the big steel cabinet. So. Uh, the bypass circuitry, it's uh, modular, so uh, this is all our bypass. You've got your drive bypass contactor, then uh, this here is what they call the RBCU, so that's the uh, bypass control module. But uh, the module can be replaced by itself. All these components here can individually be replaced, but if you have some kind of catastrophic failure in your bypass circuitry, you can order this whole module for your bypass, pull the whole pan out, drop this whole pan in, and you're done. So uh, depending on what the failure is, you can get your replacement part in a uh, way that makes the most sense and easiest to uh, change out in the field. So uh, the uh, drive, the side-by-side uh, -side or box style, that's going to be a metal enclosure. So uh, let's see. The uh, drive input fuses, something mentioned there. On the uh, bypasses, the drive is protected by fuses. The bypass is not. 
reason for that is if the uh, drive has some kind of a failure, we want to take the drive out of the circuit as fast as we can without tripping upstream protection, so we have the option to switch over to bypass. So a circuit breaker is going to trip a lot slower than a set of fuses will, so the drive is protected by these fuses, so if there's a short in the system, the drive can blow its fuses, get itself out of the circuit, and the bypass will still have power, so it can automatically transfer to bypass, and you're up and running again. So uh, all the bypasses you're going to see input fuses, but those are protecting the drive only. <coughs> Of that service switch. Apparently, they have an automatic um, bypass, so much more model numbers. There's our uh, box style, so I don't think we got an inside view. But if you actually open it up, the, uh, the drive is on the right hand side, and then kind of that vertical bypass panel you saw earlier there, where you got all the components there, that equivalent would be on the left hand side here, so that's where all your bypass components are. Yeah, run state. And there's our. Uh, Big R8 frame. If you get an R8 bypass, it uh, basically looks like your R8 drive would, anyways. You just got this extra keypad here because one's for the drive, one's for the bypass. <coughs> so, enclosure ratings uh, out of the box, just basic base drive is going to be a NEMA Type 1 or a UL1. So, it really doesn't protect the drive other than just keeping fingers out of it. Go up to the 12, it keeps dust flying stuff out of the in the air from getting in the drive. It uh, protects against splashed liquids. It's uh, non-corrosive liquids, though. And then uh, once you get to uh, drives with a disconnect, that's where you're going to go into this big box. Then you can get the uh, same 1 and 12 rating. You can also get the 3R. So if you have somewhere that's going to be installed on the roof, on the side of an air handler or something like that, you'd be getting into the 3R enclosure. And that can be with or without a bypass. Uh, vertical bypass is only available in the UL Type 1, so if you're using those verticals, that has to be indoors only. There's uh, no way to get that vertical configuration outside. And then uh, you can get the bypasses as a Type 1, 12, or 3R enclosure, but that's we're going back to that big steel box. So it's conduit entry, which you guys don't have to worry about there. All the uh, options cards, which are the same for all of them, because it's still the same drive, you just added extra options to them. Oh, okay, we got 550 versus 580. So uh, differences between them, kind of talked that, about that in the beginning, too. The uh, ACH series drive is more for HVAC application, so a fan or a pump where the ACS is more industrial. Uh, they have different keypads. They're not interchangeable. Well, one of the major differences you'll see is the uh, hand auto on the HVAC drive is local remote on the industrial drive and they won't switch on the fly. So if you're in remote mode and you hit local, it's got to kind of reset itself, stop, go to remote, and then start up startup again, or same thing going back the other way. On the HVAC drive, if you're in auto mode, you can just walk up, hit hand, and you got control, and then you can ramp it up and down, and you hit auto when you're done, and it goes back and starts following the set point again. So you don't have that seamless transfer on the industrial drives that you do on the HVAC drives. Uh, also, the help button is missing on the... Uh, industrial drive, so that becomes a uh, direction change button on the industrial, whereas we got a little help key on the HVAC. Uh, another difference, the ACS has torque control mode, which the uh, HVAC drive does not, so that's more an industrial thing where rather than your variable being running at a certain speed, you want to run the motor at whatever speed you need to to maintain a torque, so that'd be used more for load sharing if you got multiple motors on the common drive shaft and you want them to share the load evenly. Then the yeah. ECS is also missing the uh, typical building protocols you'd have for HVAC applications, so BACnet, N2, and FLN. Uh, it does have Modbus. That's all it has, though. So uh, that's a mistake you don't want to make if you're uh, selecting a drive. If it's somewhere where they're running something off of BACnet and you get an ACS, it won't have BACnet. There's no way to add it. So uh, down here, kind of what they're saying there, once it's an ACH, it's always an ACH. So the Firmware can be upgraded within the drive type, but we can't change an ACH to an ACS or vice versa. So it's it's locked within that type. All right, there you go. So that was quick. So any uh, questions on there? Not too much. Yeah, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah. Now now we'll get into the uh, motors. So. Blaming drives for chewing up bearings and windings and all that kind of fun stuff. 
So uh, motor standards, uh, if you've uh, done much with motor selection for drives, you would have seen the uh, NEMA MG1. There's part 30, which is uh, non-inverted drives. Part 31 is uh, concerning motors that are going to be connected to a VFD, the uh, delta voltage, delta time configure consideration, so how fast the voltage changes over a given amount of time. So this is stuff that's happening within microseconds, so millionths of a second. But we'll see that a little bit later. It has to do with rise time and spikes getting sent down the line and uh, punching holes in our motor winding insulation. So grounding methods, which uh, goes a long ways in uh, protecting bearings. We've got lead lengths for motor failures, and then uh, bearing currents and common mode filters. So. Uh, NEMA NG131, if you actually pull up the standard, they have all this fancy math they run through, but essentially when you get to the end of it all, you got a uh, 480 system, your motor has to be capable of withstanding is it, at least 1,488 volts. So it used to be kind of the uh, number they threw out there was 1,600 volts. So if you got a uh, inverter rated motor, the typical number to see is it's good for withstanding up to uh, 1,600 volts. And then uh, if you got a 575, volt motor that has to meet that same NEMA MG131 standard, they have to be at least at 1,783 volts withstand. So uh, where this number is coming from, the uh, drive where we have that pulse width modulation signal coming off the drive, so we have that 650 volts that it's using to create this artificial sine wave, and we're always sending this 650 volts to the motor. Those pulses, the spikes going out to the motor, the motor is a... Uh, has a high impedance, it's going to take some of those and try to reflect them back the line up towards the drive again. So short line lengths, typically that's not a problem. Once the rule of thumb is 100 feet, it can't happen closer to the drive than that. But a kind of rule of thumb we'll throw out there is anything 100 feet or greater, the timing of those pulses can get such as the pulses leaving the drive going to the motor can sync up with the pulses that are getting reflected back from the motor. And when those pulses stack up on each other, then it doubles. So you're 650 volt pulse going out to the motor just turned into a 1300 volt spike at the motor terminals. So the uh, NEMA MG130 motors only have to be good to up to 1000 volts. So if you just hit your 1000 volt rated motor winding with 1300 volts, it's not going to be long until you got a short somewhere in your motor winding. So that's where this part 31 standard came in and why they're coming up with this calculation to get to that number. So uh, Insulation class, that uh, has to do with temperature rating. It's not voltage rating. So uh, EMN G1 or 31 doesn't uh, have anything to do with like it's a class B or F insulation. It's just uh, purely how much voltage it can withstand. So DVD-T, it's our uh, change in voltage over a change in time. So this is our kind of standing back looking at a uh, waveform coming out of the drive. If you really zoomed in tight to one of these, you'd see an individual pulse. You've got to start, jumps up, stays on for whatever period of time, and then shuts itself back off again. So the speed that rises is what we're calling the uh, DVDT there. If it rises too fast, it has a tendency to overshoot. So rather than stopping at 650 volts, you're going to have a little overshoot anyway. So maybe, say, it makes it up to 720 volts or something. If you have a uh, rise time that's really quick, it starts getting out of control, and you're spike is getting a lot higher than that, and then if you get this voltage doubling effect, then your spikes are going to be even worse. So uh, a big part of uh, drive manufacturing and how they design the drives is trying to keep that rise time as short as they can. So uh, ABVs, they're showing the, the typical uh, measurement is uh, from 10 to 90 percent of whatever the total voltage is. Rather than starting at zero, we start at 10 percent and up to 90 percent of our finish voltage for whatever that pulse is intended to be, that's where they measure the rise time at. So ABV, it's what, 1,300 volts per microsecond. You got competitor VFD, whoever that is, but you know a budget-priced VFD isn't going to have the same engineering in it, in it and their one of the sacrifices is that it's going to have a much faster, sloppier rise time, so your potential for voltage spikes goes up, and then if you get that doubling, your result is going to be even worse there. So uh, those spikes, uh, main concern there is uh, chewing up the uh, insulation on your uh, motor windings. So if you're hitting it with those spikes, the higher spikes, if you start exceeding what that motor insulation can handle, it's eventually going to cause some kind of a shorter breakdown in your insulation. So you'll have a, a motor failure there. It can also cause uh, higher bearing current issues, that common mode current. 
uh, for uh, retrofitting existing motors, we're talking about there, if you have the uh, existing motor that's not the uh, MG1 part 31 rated, then uh, you have to do something to protect it. If the drive is really close to the motor, you're probably fine because you really don't have the line length distance for the timing to match up to get that doubling effect. But uh, the longer, the farther out you go, the higher the probability goes that you may have that phenomenon start occurring. Unfortunately, there's not really a hard and fast rule where you can guarantee yes, you will, or no, you won't see it happen. But uh, short lengths are safer than long ones. Uh, if you do have an old motor, you got to stick it on the drive. If you want to protect it, then we put what you call a DVDT filter between the drive and the motor. So that filter will uh, slow down the rise time between the drive and the motor. So if one of those spikes is rising up really quick, when it goes through that filter, it gets slowed down, dampened out quite a bit. So the motor isn't seeing the same rise time that the drive is putting in. So uh, that will allow you to apply a modern drive to an old motor if it's somewhere it wouldn't be cost effective to try to swap that motor out along the drive. Is that part of the line reactor? It's, uh, it would be, well, in this case, it would be a load reactor because it's on the load side of the drive. So load reactor is a similar idea to the right 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 but it's not as effective. And you're, it's like a maybe a 15% price difference between a uh, load reactor versus a DVD-T filter. And the uh, DVD-T filter is far more effective than the load reactor. It also does a lot to uh, help clamp down on the common load currents, which is where that high frequency excess voltage is getting generated from and trying to get back to the drive or through the bearings if it has nowhere else to go. So uh, we typically we say go with the DVD filter because it's not a lot more expensive and you get a lot more benefit for it. But uh, yeah, load reactor would be the same thing. Line reactor would be on the incoming side of the drive. So you can order those external to the drive? Oh yeah, yep. And, and they go on the line side? The, uh, the filter would go on the load side, so between the drive and the motor. So we're trying to, in this case, we're trying to protect so the reactor and DVT filter. It, it, both of them are going on the load side. Yeah, and this is a, a line reactor would go on the line side. That's more okay. like our, uh, what we call a swinging choke. If you have a drive without any kind of a reactor in it for harmonics mitigation, you'd put a line reactor in front of your drive, and that would try to trap harmonics so they don't get into your building and go upstream and cause issues up there. So there's a, they can be applied to both sides of the drive. So line side of the drive, we're trying to keep our voltage in the drive. Line side of the drive, we're trying to control the rise time of voltage going to the motor so we don't end up causing issues with our bearings or motor windings. you have any pictures of all three of those? Um, I, well, I don't know if they, I don't think we do have pictures on here. They, uh, basically it looks like three little transformer coils or big transformer so coils. They look like CTs. Yeah. I, 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 you know, so there's no real difference when you look at them. How do you know the difference between the, uh, the well, load reactor, DVT, uh, the load reactor and, uh, will just reactor. have um, the load reactor will truly just be coils. Whereas the DVD T filter will also have a resistor and capacitor bank in there too, which is part of its filtering technology, which helps it work a lot better. So yeah, the, the DVD T filter, you're you're going to see a capacitor in there, and you might be able to see the resistors in there too. Whereas the load reactor is just three coils sitting there in the row and you got power in, power out, and off to the motor. Right. So yeah, if you're if you're really on a, a tight budget, and then a load reactor is better than nothing, but if you can sweeten the little cost mm -hmm. addition you get into a DVD-T filter, it's much better protection for the motor. And then uh, actually another uh, thing we'll use the uh, filter for is if you need to boost your line length, which gets into this right here. The, uh, we got a maximum cable length you can have between the drive and the motor. If you need to go farther than that, adding a DVD-T filter will buy you another 50% length. So if you know, 300 feet is the max you can do, add a filter, and you can go up to 450 feet between the drive and the motor. How big are these things? I mean, you're putting them in the drive? They, they get bigger as the drive gets bigger. So it's yeah, it's it's look like yeah, the, the enclosure will. Yeah, the, the enclosure will drive the size of the, uh, the filter too. <laughs> it's not a closed filter. If you got a drive cabinet that has room, you can just take a get a non-enclosed filter. So you just got your three coils and plop it in there, and you're done. If it has to have its own cabinet, then it's going to be a lot bigger to make room for that cabinet. But they uh, they are sized for the the load they're going to be. Uh, Protecting your size based on the motor, not the drive, because the filter needs to be loaded down the 
works the most effectively. So if you have an oversized drive and you put an oversized filter between the drive and this undersized motor, the filter's not going to be working as well as it should be because it's not actually getting loaded down enough to work properly. So filters get sized based on the motor, not the drive. Yeah. So, okay, so line length here. So this is, uh, there's two different ways to look at it. Uh, maximum lead length from the VFD perspective. So in this case, our limiting factor has nothing to do with motor production. We, we care less about the motor right now. What we uh, run into to limit the length is once you get so much copper on the outputs of the drive, we start having issues with capacitance in there and the line will start charging and discharging as the drive is trying to run the motor and the drive will see that change in current and treat it like a uh, overcurrent or a uh, earth fault if it's seeing a mismatch. In, current coming out versus going back, which we could, must have gone to ground and we'll get a nuisance trip on an earth fault. So uh, that's that's what the maximum cable well, length is we're talking about here, which is what you're going to see in the back of the user's manual. So that's uh, purely for making sure the drive can operate correctly. It has nothing to do with protecting the motor. So from the motor standpoint, we get what they call a reflected wave or standing wave. That's where those voltage pulses match up timing with each other at the motor terminals and you get that doubling effect. That can occur long before the max lead length on the drive. So go back here, the shortest we can go, or they recommend the smallest drive is 330 feet. We can go up to 650 feet, 980 feet on an R8 drive. So uh, well beyond that 100 foot rule of thumb where that timing can start to match up for the standing wave effect. So uh, that has nothing to do with protecting the motors. So on this side here, that's where uh, you want to really keep the uh, length shorter if you can, if you have the option to uh, do so. Keeping the drive close to the motor is going to give you a better chance of not having this phenomenon occurring. So, so the DVT filter, mm -hmm. I mean, say you got you got one that you're you know you're having you know you know that you're totally kind of pushing your mm -hmm. you're over a heartbeat, you're I don't know, 200 square sure. feet. You know, if if you to to help the you know the motor out, can you put the DVT reactor in and it's going to lessen the, the standing wave? Or is that, you it know, will, basically it's just a function of you got to shorten the length? Uh, it should uh, lessen the uh, standing wave, but not completely kill it. So we got, yeah, here we go here. So this, this is a uh, TCI graph. So there's TCI or uh, MTEs, kind of the other major factor, or manufacturer of filters, but we're showing without the filter. You can see the rise time and the big spike there. And then with the filter, you get a little bit of a jump, but not bad. So it really clamps down on that spike. So uh, if the timing is such that you get any kind of standing wave at the motor, it's greatly reduced. Part of the class. So, uh, they have a. Into the shot. I think is a. They guarantee on their uh, V1K that it'll stay under a thousand volts. So your 1K comes from with the TCI filter, and if you're staying under a thousand volts, then you're under the thousand volts on your standard motor rating. So you're fine with the drive, which is kind of the whole point of uh, sticking there to protect the uh, motor. If you have an older motor that's not inverter rated, so yeah, it slows down the rise time a lot. You can see it cleans up a lot of these high spikes, and uh, any spikes you do have are clamped down enough that the Timing, if it syncs up, it's not going to be enough to give you a spike that is going to get outside the range of what that motor insulation can handle. So when you're replacing a drive, you uh, replace the filter too? Uh, no, shouldn't need to because it's sure. just a coil, so it's not really any electronic components. So then your capacitor, because if your capacitors are breaking down on the filter, the, yeah, aside from having to worry about the capacitors, it's kind of like a transformer. It's just a coil that sits there and slows the current as it goes through it. Oops. I actually one, oh, submersible pumps. So uh, this is actually one I ran into I think just a couple months ago. Uh, submersible pump motors uh, often will require an output filter because they won't have this NEMA MG131 rating. So they'll just automatically, I think this one's a Franklin submersible pump. They have something where they say in their documentation, if you're putting this thing on a drive, it's got to have a filter. So, uh, that's uh, something to watch out for there if you're doing uh, submersible pumps and uh, putting them on a drive. So there's our uh, V1K, so you can see we got our uh, inductor there, our L, and then got a resistor down there, and down far we got a resistor and capacitor bank there. So a lot more going in on a uh, DVDT filter than just a load reactor by itself, which would just be your three inductor coils in and out, and you're done. And that's why I added this reserve pulse. So uh, proper grounding, so uh, it's getting more to uh, trying to protect the... Uh, 
well, giving you a, a good installation for one thing, you're just uh, drive running a little more stable and less nuisance trips, but also trying to uh, protect the uh, motor bearings from this uh, common mode current. So the drive, we have this high frequency, it's sending out to the motor and the drive is ultimately trying to fake this sine wave. So the sine wave that the drive is creating, that's, that's good energy in the motor. That's what we want at the motor to be doing useful work. But we have that leftover high frequency noise in the right. motor. and right. So you have it built up in the windings. Yeah. Yeah, it's down there. But uh, it builds up in the motor. Ultimately, it's trying to get back to the drive. But it doesn't have an effective means to do so. It's going to find wherever oh, is available to it. And if it goes through the I bearings, it's going to be tuning up the bearings that's there. That's so uh, the grounding is a really big deal on the drive. Uh -huh. The uh, don't want you uh, relying on conduit for grounding between the drive and the motor. You want to see a separate copper conductor from the drive frame, ideally yep. to the motor frame. So if you got a uh, control panel where there's drives in the control panel, and you just have a grounding bar in there, and you take all your motor wires and go to the grounding bar rather than each of individual drive, you're already kind of introducing an extra path that we have to go through to ultimately get back to the drive. So uh, best insulation practice, we want to see a separate ground conductor from the drive to the motor, no breaks, no splits, no sharing with anything else. Other size than one of the leads? Yeah, yep, yep, so yeah, standard NEC sizing is fine there. Or hey, you know, that'd be really good. So uh, yeah, conduit does need to be bonded, so uh, thing uh, we want to have uh, there, you want to have a metal conduit from the drive to the motor. So uh, what that's doing is keeping all the electrical noise and harmonics on the output of the drive from getting onto any adjacent equipment. So uh, electrically, the signal coming off of the drive is very dirty, very noisy. You don't want that getting picked up on any other equipment and getting cycled back into that. So it's very harmonics heavy, which will uh, cause extra currents on the conductors, make stuff heat up more. If it's sensitive equipment, it can cause all kinds of issues if you're like in a lab or somewhere where you got a lot of sensitive equipment there. So uh, I want to make sure the output of the drive is in its own metal conduit and has its own ground conductor. That'll go a long ways in uh, taking care of a lot of these problems guys run into with drive installations. So it's uh, not necessarily stuff that really has to be done special, just has to be done right. If it's a sloppy installation, that's where you can see all of these problems start cropping up. So uh, VFD cable, really uh, fancy, expensive stuff. It uh, oh, actually does a really good job of uh, protecting against motor totally. currents because instead of just having this uh, single ground conductor, we have a uh, braided yeah, shield yeah. has a real high surface area, which the high frequency noise likes running along. So it gives an excellent path from the motor back to the drive for all this high frequency noise to get back to the drive without having to look for another route. So uh, the inverter cable does work really well for that, but it's also horrendously expensive. So, yeah, you can kind of see it. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> OEMs don't even put their uh, yeah. output wires in conduit. So, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, pretty weird you have to see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the, uh, yeah, the one job I saw it on, we had a, a situation where uh, electricians had run multiple motors in a conduit, and we were having all kinds of issues, and uh, they didn't want to take the time or didn't have labor available to run the separate conduits to split everything out. So the fix they came up with, which was okay, is they had two drives and one conduit. So they pulled out one of the sets of motor wires and replaced it with one of these inverter cables. So that inverter cable and the conduit was shielded within itself. So it was isolated and the other conductors in there were just doing their thing. So uh, in that case, it worked. The stuff was, I think it was $10 a foot and that was for a 20 horsepower drive. So looking at it was 23. Yeah, so it's probably like number 10 shielded and $10 a foot. So extremely expensive stuff, but it does do a really good job at what it's designed to do. So you have your uh, braided shield, gets the high frequency noise from the motor back to the drive really effectively. And it also has the uh, shielding around the cable, so you don't have to put it in conduit. It's already carrying its own shield, so you can take a bundle of these, drop them in a cable tray, and be done. Uh, you, you pay dearly for that. You're going to love me if I just say. So here's a little uh, diagram of kind of... Uh, What's going on with the high frequency currents? So we've got the current the, uh, drive on its way to the motor. Once it gets to the motor, we have a common mode current that's going to be left there as well and start building up. So the uh, power from the drive is going to the windings on the outside of the motor. We're also inducing the uh, current on the rotor itself because that's where we get it magnetized and the motor starts spinning around doing its job. 
that right. common mode current left there in the motor on the rotor right. side, that's where it's looking to try and get it back to drive somehow. It got right. left over there. No, I think that's why the next slide kind of gives the numbers on there. It's like three or four volts is enough to break the oil film in the bearing. So it, it really doesn't take much of well, that. that the uh, current to sit and build up there until it's generated enough that it's going to start jumping across the oil film and the bearing. So once you do that, it's going from the rotor through the bearing like, to the motor frame. Was, then once you've got the motor frame, the motor frame's grounded, so it can fall ground and get back to the drive that way. So uh, that's what's happening in the motor and why we have current even trying to go through the bearings. There you go. So we got our rotor charge builds up. I'm wondering as it volts is what they're estimating is enough to break through the oil film that the bearing's riding in. As soon as you do that, you have a little electric arc that makes it across that race and goes through the ball bearing and through the other race. So once you've got an electric arc, there's going to be some kind of scoring there in a little pit in the bearing, and that's just domino effect from there. Once it starts, every time it comes past, you've got a weak point there, and you'll bump in the bearing race, and it's going to do it again. It just expands out from there. So you're saying the grounding loop's going to solve that, but it's not going to solve that. It's, uh, because you're still, you know, it's still... Happy, you know, the problem is well, the, the voltage on the, the rotor. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the proper grounding, the problem is the, 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 the common mode is what we're trying to get. Yeah. It's the high frequency noise that the, because the kind of the, you know, the sine wave the drive is trying to fake out, that as a whole like, kind of neutralizes itself. Uh, from from the all high frequency components and that was left behind is let me warn these people we're uh, having issues with making the jump across there. So if we can. That's provide a good enough from. ground path that it can get from the motor back to the drive right and four so we don't have enough left there where we can build up enough charge to make the jump. That's where we're protecting the bearings. So the, the phenomenon is still there. I mean, you haven't, you haven't changed physics. You still have this electrical field in there. And it's inducing the field into the rotor because that's how we get it magnetized and get the thing spinning. But if we can uh, ground it well enough to move that high frequency noise back from the motor to the source, which is the drive, and we right, can uh, keep that voltage down oh, yeah. low enough that we're not going to have to make right. that jump across. Right. I didn't yeah, that physically, physically the, you know, the electrical yeah. physics are still there. We haven't yeah. replaced those. So, so there's ADB in knowing all this. Mm -hmm. and all these mm -hmm. researchers with the preliminary cable. Uh, so is there any other brands out nice. there, any other things you would suggest that do work? Oh, yeah, shaft grounding. That's me. This is that's, but I mean, need more. As far as like brains of shaft grounding, or well, there's cool blue, there's certain things. Yeah, cool blue is a uh, common mode. So I guess there's there's different ways to go about it depending on the type too. So like cool blue, they try to trap the common mode with current yeah, before it ever even makes it to the motor, so you don't have the problem in the first place. And then you have shaft grounding, so there's like Aegis, or SGS, or they, you might have that common mode current at the motor, and that's okay because they're going to give it a path around the bearing. So there's different ways to solve the problem. Because shaft grounding wears so fast. Yeah, it can, yeah. Go somewhere else. I talked to a guy at ABB a while back and said that the five CS drives, it's just a way of switching that gate. They, to, to we have a uh, common mode filter, so kind of like we were talking about the two blue, which is the manufacturer's the common mode filter, so, so they're trying to trap this common mode current it? coming from the drive, so whatever gets to the I don't know, the, the 550 drive, so I have to I what horsepower it is, I don't remember off the top of my head, but the uh, they have a common mode filter in the drive standard. Like you don't see it in the main circuitry in the drive, so ABB has done stuff to try to mitigate it and trap the box. So there is a common mode filter in the drive that tries to trap a lot of that, and obviously some of it still makes it out there. And How long has that been in? Three days into this. How long has that still been in the duration? That's been in there for the, well, like, from the 550, as far as I know. You've been in your phone. I'm not in a nice way. I'm not, you know, 550 is manufactured. I don't think there's anything that was added mid-production. It could, yeah. Right now. Yeah, because you know, obviously if you're if you're having bearing issues Monday, on the 550, we know the 550 has its common mode I mean, filter and it's anything. it's not this you know, ABP yeah, doesn't guarantee that we won't have bearing issues. Anymore. They're just doing something to try to <laughs> minimize the issue. But yeah, if you do put additional filter on it and then you can try to trap that even more. That's not the long before you come to tell anybody. No, it's yeah, it's a ferrite filter. So yeah, it's like a passive device that sits there. Oh, the current. I'm trying to do it. Things before I, you know, so, you know, but yeah, different ways to try to get around the problem. The, uh, the cable does a really good path of 
or the switch the output gives you an effective path from the motor back to the drive, so the noise doesn't hang out, but it gets back to the drive right away. You can go the Hulu route, which is the common mode filter, up at the drive end, so you're trying to catch on the common mode. I know the port makes it to the motor, or you go shaft grounding route, which, which if there is any common mode, the current is building up at the motor, you give it a path around the bearings, so it doesn't have to use the bearings. There's also insulated bearings as well, and ceramic bearings, so if the bearing race gets energized, it doesn't matter because it impacts a ceramic ball, and it's not going to make the jump because you can't do it. So. A lot well, of different uh, ways that people will come up. I'm out there uh, stepping up and saying, I, yeah, I'll around. show you around. Yeah, come on. So uh, this is some sites you're going to get on every drive you know, installation. It's kind of a thing, thing, thing to be aware of. So if you have a motor like that, you take the same thing, pull the bearing out. I'm curious, trying to figure out what the failure is. Okay, cool. Two different... Types of failures you see on that, it's what they call fluting and frosting. So this guy on the left is fluting, so you see kind of a washboard pattern, or you can get frosting. So on the other side there, so it's not any particular pattern that's varying. It kind of takes on this fuzzy frosted look. So if you see either one of those, you pull out a failed bearing, you have to say you know, kind of a telltale sign that you're having issues with arcing inside the bearing. So that, at that point, it pretty well confirms you know what you're up against, and then you just have to. Well, that's why I asked you to try to mitigate it. That was at 7.30 this morning. Uh, Jack Brown, they can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, uh, they, this, they don't have that label. It's probably an Aegis ring. I'm not aware of any other manufacturers that do something like that. There's a SPS, they do something a little different. They have a uh, cap on the back of the motor you put on it. It has a little carbon brush that rides on the contact. So, two different ways to. Uh, Kind of hits the same and resolved there. But showing their little example here. So we have 20 volts sitting at the shaft without any kind of ground power there. So well in excess of the three or four takes to break through the oil mill. And then once you put the ring on there, what we have left is one, just a little over one volt. So well under the threshold. So there is still going to be something there. Saying, so the physics of how. Motors and system, electricity oh, work, you can't fail. completely get rid of the phenomenon, but you can it's gonna take it down to a level enough to where it's not you going to try to arc across the bearing. Right? Well, it's, you know, I don't know. Think about it. Why would you take on somebody yeah, else? Yeah, if it gets dirty, if they're not making contact with the shaft, then they're, they're not arcing anymore. So, sure. yeah, things to be aware of there, too. So, this is the uh, common mode so, filter, uh -huh. which that's what the so, uh, true blue you might have concept of the zero mode filter, 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 filter as well. Then each other that we drop shot of what the common mode filter looks like on a smaller frame drive. To get the one, these are actually large copper bus bars or larger frame drives. Same thing, still going through that common mode filter there. And I'm like, oh, we got water through this, Glenn. We're back here. So it's kind of a review here. So for best results, obviously, if you're, if you're starting the uh, insulation from the ground up, if you know a motor's going to be on that ride and you're picking the motor out too, you want the MG1 R31 compatible motor. So that uh, that doesn't do anything for a bearing. So that's a, uh, kind of a common misconception. Guys will get a what they think is an inverter rated motor and they're good to go. And then they put it in installation where it's not protecting the bearings adequately and they lose their bearings on their inverter rated motor and trying to figure out what in the world happened. But the uh, MG131 rating, all that's applied to is the motor windings to make sure they can withstand the voltage spikes if you have that standing wave. And so I like, yeah, there. That, so uh, some inverter rated motors will have shaft grounding, but it's not part of the uh, MG131 rating. So if you want shaft grounding, make sure that's something the manufacturers, including from what as well. But uh, inverter rated doesn't mean the same thing to all people. So you gotta kind of. Do your homework and verify what the manufacturer yeah, means when they say yeah, you could just got an inverter rated motor. So uh, proper grounding is a real big one. I think uh, a couple of you have been in the uh, startup class. They they beat that one to death. They really want to make sure you ground properly between the drive and the motor. So that that goes a long ways into uh, keeping a lot of these problems to a minimum. And then uh, last one, well designed drive, helping minimize the damage. So we can slow the rise time down a little bit. Which the, ABB has a fairly low rise time compared to a lot of the drives out there, and we also have that common mode filter. So it doesn't kill everything, but helps a ton. I think that's the end there. All right. So any questions or stuff you want to go over on that?
you have some troubleshooting stuff as far as? Yes, I do. So, yep, that is the that is the next one. So, if you want to hit that? Are we doing the trainers? Is it the motor? Yeah, then yeah, for troubleshooting, so we can uh, go ahead and break out the trainers for the guys who are here and put those through their paces. Get some more meat. We still have bridges coming up. We still have beer all night. All right. So troubleshooting. So uh, you got a uh, troubleshooting call on drive motor. Stuff isn't working correctly. At least an ABB's recommendation. Uh, they're recommending start at the motor, go backwards from there. So make sure your load, whatever it is, is able to run. You don't have a seized motor or pump. Something's not jammed in your fan, whatever. So just start with the super simple basic stuff. Can the motor even spin? So once you know your machine can operate, it's free moving, nothing mechanical is holding you back, then you can start working your way back from there, from the motor up to the drive. So we got what mechanical brake, gearbox, we're not going to see so much in the HVAC stuff, uh, belt shaves, you may see that, other mechanical problems, so if it is a uh, seized load. So make sure the drive has power, if the drive isn't uh, running, ask them if they turned it on first. Circuit breaker disconnect open. Uh, power distribution issues. So uh, on fuses cleared, that uh, that one can kind of catch you out. The drive will run on uh, single phase power, so that uh, that can throw you off. It's, uh, going back to the way the drive works, you got three phases coming in. You turn it into DC, and the drive does its thing on the output. If you put two phases in the drive, it can rectify two phases just as well as three phases. So it still has DC, and it'll still run the motor. So it won't do it well at partial loads. It'll mask the issue. Once you uh, get up to a higher load on the motor, that's where the drive is going to start having issues, and you'll get over voltage alarms or DC bus alarms because the drive is struggling to maintain a nice clean DC voltage because we have this big hole in our rectified waveform. You got two phases, and then there's a gap, and then two phases, and there's a gap. The that partial load where we're not really working, pulling a lot of voltage off that DC bus, the drive can mask that, and you could run a drive for a couple of weeks on two phases and not know it, and then suddenly you decide to ramp it up a little bit, and the drive trips off, and you're going, what in the world happened? So uh, something to watch for on that if you're having uh, issues with the drive giving you uh, DC bus voltage alarms, either it's unstable or it's seeing oscillations in there, check and make sure you have all three phases of power coming into the drive. So had uh, situations where you came in, I think it was, at the, uh, it was a Navy hospital out in Bremerton, we had a nasty windstorm come through and a few days later we had a call that one of the drives kept tripping off and uh, went out and checked everything programming was all good you'd run it and do fine you'd ramp it up and it'd trip out and check voltage and they checked it and they said it was fine if you check each phase of the ground you should see 277 277 we had 277 and zero and turned out we lost a phase and the guess there is you have some power spike or something in the windstorm and it popped the fuse and if they weren't running the thing at full load nobody knew and it just kept running for a few days until they finally loaded it down enough that it caused the problem. So uh, make sure you got all three phases there. That can uh, throw you for a loop if you got two. I got a question yeah. from somebody that uh, said they, what, what are the energy, is there an energy savings mm -hmm. if you took like a say a single phase five horsepower motor, mm -hmm. put in a three phase uh, five horsepower motor and on, on drive, so you bring single phase into the drive, it converts it to three. Okay. Would it? Would, is there it's, energy savings to do it? The um, I guess it depends on your load. So like five horsepower is five horsepower. However, you get it that way. So if you uh, if you can slow it down, so say you got a five horsepower and you really only need to be running the thing at 30, 40 hertz to move enough air or water, whatever the process is, then at that point, then you're saving energy. So. Uh, in a single phase application, you'd, you'd still be changing it because energy doesn't disappear. You have the laws of conservation of energy. It's you're using what you're using. So uh, if you are going to single phase a drive, it's uh, you have to upsize the drive to do that because we're only using half of the input diode bridge, and the capacitor bank is going to be undersized to filter that missing phase out. So to do that, we have to uh, double the size of the drive to consistently make it work, and it's. It's, the drives are listed to do that for the 208, 240 volt drives. For uh, 480, they're not listed for that, not sized for that. Which you're you're not going to see single phase 480 anymore. If you got 480, it's always three phase. 
but the uh, the 208 three phase drives can be fed with 240 single phase, and then you can turn around and run a three phase motor on the output. So uh, yeah, in that regard, you could still get the energy savings just by virtue of you're slowing the motor down. So if you're you run a the five horse motor at 40 hertz, and it's only taking three and a half horsepower to keep it at that speed, and that carries the load, then you've saved energy there. But yeah, if you're if you're going to do it on a single phase application, you have to double the drive size to allow the drive to run single phase. Yeah, so it's a it's a big uh, big D right there because we're we're only using two thirds of our diode bridge on the incoming side, so that's part of it is we need to make sure we're spreading the current across the uh, the two evenly instead of trying to what would have been shared across three, so we got to boost that size. And the other problem is the capacitor bank in the drive needs to be big enough to kind of filter out the hole that we're leaving in the rectified waveform since we're only using two phases now. So, does that answer it? Yeah. Thing? Okay, cool. So I actually uh, did that at home because you know, when we work with drives, you uh, get free drives a lot. So my, my drill press at home is a 240-volt drive running a three-phase 208 motor on the drill press. Just because I could. <laughs> but, yeah, it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fun because I, I got it pretty oh, yeah, so it's, still it's set at constant sport <laughs> torque and it'll compensate speed so you can be really hogging through something as soon as it breaks through rather than taking off and speeding up it just immediately compensates and you'll see a little blip and that's about it and that's just a very constant speed full torque through whatever you do with the thing. So, you the fun things that. you can do. <laughs> All right, so uh, what do we got here? It's left off on fuses. Uh, display diagnostics operational. So provided you actually have a fault code on the drive, you can go through the uh, diagnostics, see what the uh, drive is telling you about the fault. So a lot of times the uh, drive ends up being one of our better troubleshoots when troubleshooting tools when you have an issue with a uh, drive motor installation because the drive is looking at so many different things in the motor. If anything goes wrong, the drive is going to catch it. And it'll uh, give us that snapshot of everything it was doing when it saw that fall. So uh, that, that can go a long ways into helping figure out what condition is causing the drive to fault out on. A lot of times the fault isn't the fault of the drive. The drive sees something it doesn't like, so it's shutting down to protect itself or the motor. All right, so uh, if you don't have any uh, diagnostics displays, so inferring that there is no fault, there's no alarm, the drive is just sitting there, but the motor <coughs> isn't running. Make sure your uh, start speed reference so your controls are uh, intact. So a quick way to test that, you put the drive in hand mode, start the motor, see if it ramps up and down, if everything works correctly in hand mode. Uh, if you can run the drive in hand mode, can't find any problems with the motor, there's a good chance the drive and motor are probably both fine. It might be a uh, issue on the controls and the drive is just being, doing what it thinks it's being told to do. So uh, run in hand mode, make sure that works. If that does, then you can go back and check your uh, controls and make sure you actually have a true start-stop signal and speed signal. So this is a situation where you go into that uh, parameter group one in the drive where you see all this real-time data. You can look at the digital input and analog input on the drive and see what the drive believes it's being sent, if it's actually being given a start command or if it thinks it's being given a speed command or not. Uh, also, check your run enable safeties. Uh, safeties would be pretty evident because you'd have this start enable missing alarm on the drive. That run enable, I was talking about earlier, the only thing you're going to see is that little arrow on the top left corner of the keypad will turn to a dashed line instead of a solid line if you're telling the drive run and run enable isn't there. So uh, that's something real subtle to make sure you look for. So it's kind of, again, talking about the uh, running the drive in local or hand mode, so just making sure that electrically, mechanically, everything's okay. You can actually run the equipment. So if you can in that case, then it's really kind of pointing back to more likely the control side. So uh, issues you run into in wiring. So uh, motor wiring has to be isolated. You don't want to combine multiple motors from different drives in the same conduit. So we can get all kinds of nuisance trips and troubles there. You can get a over voltage, over current alarms, earth faults all kinds of problems. It's uh, stuff you may not see right away, so this is something where we'll look for on a uh, startup. If you see we got multiple motors dumped in one conduit, you may be able to run the drive without issue, but there's a good chance there will be an issue down the road. So that's something where we'll tell the electrician, hey, you got to 
pull this thing out and separate your motor runs. You can't have them sitting together. So uh, way to get around that, either run them in a separate conduit or if you uh, go the route of the drive cable with the shielding on it, those can all sit in a uh, common trough or conduit as well. So uh, long cable lengths, those uh, can cause issues. So you start getting that uh, standing wave effect. You can also have increased chances of uh, radio frequency interference issues if you have real sensitive equipment next to the drive. If you can keep the drive closer to the motor, that'll help tone down some of that. So the increase of stress is on the motor insulation. That's going back to that standing wave and those voltage spikes when you get your line length out enough that the timing starts getting correct for that. Uh, increased voltage drop, if you're really getting out to a uh, long distance, you might have to oversize your motor cable to compensate for voltage drop. So uh, solutions around that, either a, uh, this is actually isn't correct terminology, if it's a, uh, in the motor leads, it's no longer a line reactor, it should be a load reactor. But uh, a reactor between the drive and the motor, that will uh, help you get your lead length out farther. And then mentioned previously, if you're doing that, just go for the extra money and go for the uh, DVD T filter unless you're really on a tight budget because a lot more benefit for not a lot more cost. So you can get the uh, shielded cable, the 1600-volt uh, motor insulation, so that's talking about our uh, NEMA MG131 motors. So if you have an uh, older motor that doesn't meet that rating, if you place it with the motor that has that rating, then uh, the windings will be able to stand up to any voltage spikes if there are any, so you won't be uh, eating up your motor insulation. And then the larger gauge motor cable to compensate for voltage drop there if you got it. So a grounding. Again, want to see that single point, single conductor ground from the drive back to the motor, or motor back to the drive, whichever way you want to uh, go with that there. So I don't want to share the ground, don't want to split it off anywhere so there's no ground loops, you just want a single path. All right, so uh, ideal ground point. So at the transformer only, at the start point of the transformer, so like a Y transformer. So uh, if you have a uh, power system like corner ground to delta or high leg that uh, that kind of causes extra issues in the drive we have to deal with on the incoming power side. So really you want to be on a wide transformer which that's most of the power networks we have in the US. So anything where you got voltage phase to phase to phase is the same and phase to ground is all the same. You're on a wide network. So if you're one of your phases to ground is zero or you got a high leg then good chance you're on a delta. All right, so if you're testing the drive under power, always observe your appropriate PPE requirements. So make sure you don't uh, get yourself lit up or blown up. So use the drive display whenever possible. Again, going back to that group one. So there's a lot of information you can get out of the drive without having to even go into tearing into the drive and taking any hot measurements. So eventually you may get to the point where you need to do that. But uh, as a first line, you can go into the drive first and see if you can obtain the information from the drive menu because it's it's measuring a ton of different information when it's running the motor from there. So uh, measuring for uh, current, when, once you actually got the uh, drive motor up and running, so we know it can run okay. Uh, it should be balanced, so we're going to see it within 5% or so on the incoming outgoing side. So uh, on the incoming side, if you see a uh, big imbalance there, there's a chance we have damage on one of the inputs on the drive, so it's only pulling current on two of the three phases. So even if the fuse isn't blown, it could be damaged somewhere inside the drive. We want to make sure we got nice balanced current coming into the drive. Also, once it's leaving the drive going out to the motor, it should see balanced current as well. So if there's an imbalance there, it's either telling us the outputs of the drive aren't firing correctly or there could be a uh, resistance imbalance in the motor windings, which would show up as a uh, mismatch current draw across all three phases. So uh, normal drive designs, they can't boost output voltage. So your uh, voltage, if it's coming in at 480 volts, you're not going to get 520 volts out of the drive. What they're uh, kind of referring to here, also the uh, drives aren't 100% efficient, all that, is uh, if you're using your meter to troubleshoot the output of the drive in you're getting something well over 480 volts, what you're probably running into is the uh, multimeter, unless you have one that has a uh, low frequency filter on it, you will end up reading voltage higher than it should because of that pulse width that the drive is sending out. So this 650 volt pulse will trick the meter into reading higher than what's actually there. So that, uh, that varies some, but I've seen it, say maybe 50 to 100 volts higher than what the 
drive is actually trying to simulate going to the motor. So, true RMS meters? Will yeah, true RMS meters will get uh, faked out. So you have to have one that has a, a low pass filter. So Fluke for a while was the only one that did that because they, they were the first ones to do it, so they slapped a patent on it. So I'm not sure at this point if there's still ones or if the patents since expired and other uh, meter manufacturers are uh, doing that now as well. But I think the uh, Fluke filter, it will filter out anything above 200 hertz. I believe that's their cutoff. So the uh, switching frequency we are using, you know, out of the box, it's 4,000 hertz, 4 kilohertz. The lowest we can go is 1 kilohertz. So still 1,000 hertz, and the meter's ignoring anything above 200. So at that point, what you're seeing on the meter is closer to what the drive is trying to simulate going to the motor, which is what you want to be using for on the troubleshooting side. So uh, if, you're, if you're not sure on that, if you uh, look inside the on the drive in that group one, it will tell you what the output voltage is going to the motor. And uh, it won't always be like at full uh, speed. If you're running at 60 hertz, it may not be 460 volts. That's where that flux optimization function comes into play. And if the drive doesn't sense we need full voltage, you, you might be running at 60 hertz and 380 volts or something. But uh, yeah, if you're not sure, check the uh, output voltage in the drive menu, what it says it's sending to the motor, and then you can measure it. And if uh, you're reading way higher than that, then you're uh, Meters probably not set up for that, <clears throat> but uh, I know the uh, the most recent version of the Fluke 87, so it's the 87.5 series that has the uh, low pass filter. They have one called the 1587 as a Mega in it. That one has a low pass filter. They got I think it's half a dozen or so different Fluke meters have that low pass filter on them. And then uh, if you happen to have an old analog meter, the old analog meter is uh, not susceptible to the pulses pushing it over either. So uh, one of those old Stimson analog meters or something, you can actually read the output of a drive and get an accurate number. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't recommend using a little $15 analog meter from Home Depot. <laughs> That'd probably go boom in your hand if you put 480 to it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, that's one thing the analog meters are still good at is reading drive outputs. So uh, looking for a ground fault, uh, basically what the drive is looking for is the uh, mismatching current between the positive and negative side of the DC bus. So if you got current leaving at some level, if that's not what comes back, then the drive assumes current went somewhere else, so it probably just went to ground. So uh, the drive is uh, tripping out on that quick and dirty way to say a test it. Take your meter, your clamp meter, put it across all three motor leads. All three together should be zero or really close to it. Kind of going back to our three sine waves there. The, sum total of all those, their neutral point should be zero. If your uh, clamp meter shows you any current above zero, then that tells you right away we got a mismatch in current between each one of those three legs. So at that point, there's something, it could be in the motor, it could be in the earth fault where there's current leakage to ground, but just another test you can do. Just getting more on the uh, looking for ground fault current there. New. So uh, this, uh, most of us don't have a DC current clamp. I, I sure don't carry one around. So if you have a DC current clamp, you can use that on the uh, input legs of the drive. If you're, you're looking for uh, DC, if, there, if there's DC present, that's an indicator that the, uh, you could have a uh, open diode on one of the inputs of the drive. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone who runs around with a high current DC clamp. So the uh, risk of the drive faulting on the high bus ripple on the uh, fuel Austin input diode. So you, this is the same effect you'd also see if you lose a fuse. So the drive is trying to run on two phases instead of three. So same thing, that DC voltage in the drive, it's going to start getting a ripple on it. Once it gets too excessive, the drive will trip out. So uh, same, same end result. If you either got an open diode or a blown fuse, we're not getting current on one of the three phases coming in. So uh, this uh, one here, they uh, stuck in there. It's not something you see real often now, but uh, output current on the drive. You start ramping the drive up, everything's good. You approach 60 hertz, and all of a sudden the output current just takes off and the drive trips out on the overcurrent. Uh, there's uh, certain installations where the flux optimization you can get 
thrown off. So uh, if you run into a situation like that where the drive is, your current's ramping up as the drive ramps up and you hit full speed and all of a sudden the current just jumps, try turning off uh, flux optimization and uh, see if that solves the problem. So you just could have an installation where the uh, drive is getting fooled and not calculating correctly on how much voltage actually should be there. So input-output wiring, can't run that together. So uh, same concern is, uh, well, kind of same concern, different problems, but combining uh, different drives in a common conduit. So if you got two drives in one conduit, you'll get crosstalk between the two. So uh, the drives will trip on each other there and get nuisance trips. If input and output wiring is combined together, so we see this a lot if the drive is remote mount from the power and we got one conduit and goes all the way into the drive and they take the motor and run back out from the drive to where the motor is somewhere else, well, all those harmonics and the electrical noise that the drive is generating on the output gets induced back on the input and sent right back through the drive and the drive does not like that at all. So you've got to make sure you keep those separate. Also, if the uh, drive output is combined with any other wiring, if even it's not the uh, drive itself, you're taking all those harmonics, inducing them on those conductors and sending it into that equipment, whatever it happens to be. So really don't want to uh, combine the drive output with anything else. It needs to stay isolated. Uh, incoming lines going to the drive, that can be in a common conduit. So power coming into the drive, nothing special has happened to that yet. That's just power coming from the utility. The drive hasn't done anything to it. So you can feed multiple drives through a common conduit if that's the easier way to bring the power in and split it out and hit all your drives that way. It's just once it leaves the drive on the way to the motor, that's where you need to split it up. Uh, also, in the uh, motor conduit can't mix class one, class two wiring. So if you got something where a motor has an embedded thermistor and you're going to monitor that with a uh, would be a low voltage signal that needs to be separated out from the high voltage going to the motor. You don't want to run this little low voltage cable along with your 480 going to the motor. So yet in that case you end up having two conduits going to your motor to separate these two classes of wiring out. So control shields can promote ground loops if the shielding's not done properly. So a big thing down that if you're uh, doing controls, make sure your controls are only shielded on one end. Don't land the shields at the drive and at the control panel. So uh, analog inputs. If you got a uh, dead analog input on the drive, so uh, a situation where say you're sending a speed signal to the drive and it's just not responding, it's not ramping up or down, or maybe the thing is just pegged and you told it to slow down and it's not slowing down. Uh, there's specific resistance values we uh, look for on those uh, terminals. So uh, if you set your little dip switch for voltage, so flip to the left, you're looking for around 301 kilo ohms in this case. If you uh, set it for current, so flip to the right, you want to see about 100 ohms. If you see anything significantly outside of that, that tells us that the circuitry inside our little analog input got damaged. There's uh, also an optical isolator circuit between the uh, analog input and the circuitry on the drive's control board, so uh, the optical isolator can get damaged as well. So there you may not see a, a mismatch here, but if you verify with a meter that you're sending 5 volts to the drive or 12 milliamps, whatever it is, and you look in group 1 in the drive and the drive isn't reflecting, that's what's coming in. And then it uh, could be that isolator that's failed, in which case you got to replace the control board. That was the hardest troubleshoot. Yeah, oh yeah, if you remember yeah, a couple of years ago they had a, a bad run of those and that's what it was, <laughs> is the uh, optical isolators and uh, you, you would either get stuff where it could be different things. Your speed would get real erratic or it just peg and you go back and check it with your meter and it's stable and you go and look at the drive and it's just bouncing all over the place. You're like, what in the world? And uh, that's what it was. We had a, uh, we a bad run of the battle isolators. We feed it into the input. Yeah. And so that we knew that it was the control system. Yeah. But it's either or. It's, it's yeah. not going to be both. It'll be either or. Oh, for the reading, uh, if, if there's a little dip switch on the drive, so if you're using voltage for your speed, you'd set that switch for voltage, or if you're using uh, current, you'd set for current. So depending on which direction that switch is set is which reading you're looking for there. But I mean, if one fails, it's mm -hmm. not going to cause the other. Oh, input. no, 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 so not necessarily. switch to another input. Yeah, you could. Yep, absolutely. And get the drive running. Yep, yep, and we've done that before. If you have a uh, mm -hmm. failed analog input, yeah, don't forget we got two analog inputs. So, you know, even if you know, there's something wrong with the drive, you want to replace and get the customer a working drive, but... In the meantime, you can just reprogram it and move it, and if they're happy with that, you can leave it that way too. 
but yeah, we've done that a few times. If you just lose one analog input for whatever reason and you're not using the second one, just move it down till the drive it's looking at analog two now and off you go. So uh, something else to look for on the uh, analog input, the uh, signal going into it is always going to be DC. Or it's either DC voltage or DC milliamps. I've seen stuff where uh, guys will share a common in, back in the control panel. So it's not something they're doing intentionally. Usually it's a wiring mistake, but if we get a common shared from a transformer in there, so like our 120 to 24, 480 to 120 transformer, whatever it is, we can end up with uh, AC voltage going into the uh, input on the uh, analog input on the drive. That can damage the analog input. It can also damage the uh, communications terminal or the chip on the drive for the back net or whatever your protocol is because they have a shared ground there. So uh, I'm talking about from a power supply? Yeah, yep. So if the, uh, the ground common for your 0 to 10 volt signal somewhere got wire nutted to the common on a transformer, we end up inducing this AC ghost voltage into don't, the input on the drive. Don't they do that all the time, though? <laughs> They're so not supposed to. Yeah, you can end up with a uh, oh, real erratic output. speed signal okay. that way, too. But that's something, if you don't know to look for it, it's easy to miss. But you put your meter on DC volts and you're measuring and you got 5 volts DC and you can't figure out what's going on. You click it over to AC and check and you got 24 AC sitting on there, too. So you, you got to put your meter in AC to see it. If you're look, doing all your measurements with the meter set to DC, you're not going to see it. If you measure it. the 24 volts AC, though, is it too late? It, it can be. <laughs> it, it depends. So uh, it fix the problem, see if it goes away. If the comm still works on the drive, then you're okay. If uh, you caught a problem like that. He's mm -hmm. talking like a floating. Yeah. A flo oh, a floating, uh, 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 a floating power supply. So, mm -hmm. So if you if you yeah, yeah, if you grab if you ground if you ground a ground uh, you put your your 24 volt transformer and uh, you know now, oh, if it's, now, if it's, it's, now it's referencing ground. now it's referencing yeah. like by floating you mean uh, not isolated you know ground and I think that's you know that's kind of what we're you know so so it's the floating it's the floating power supply floating 24 volts that's always problematic yeah you know that's what that, is, you that is pretty common to, uh, you know that you have to kind of watch. It also screws up uh, protocol networks oh, too yeah. because yeah. it's basically the same thing. You only have you know you know the protocol is just switching you know on and off on really yeah. low you know uh, is voltages. Is floating the same so thing as isolated and non-isolated power no. supplies? Isolated would mean it would be not. Uh, yeah, it's it wouldn't not be, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be connected to that. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, know, I know what you mean. Yeah. But yeah. So yes. Another thing to watch for if you're troubleshooting your analogs, make sure there's no AC on there, or if you're troubleshooting COM problems, same thing. So uh, I've seen that where uh, the analog is working fine, so speed reference on the drive works okay, but we have a bunch of COM issues and can't figure out what's going on. And, so check and see if you got AC coming in on your analog input, and that that could be causing a the problem there too. How many more slides you got here? On oh, not too many. So I know they, to... Some of the guys wanted to play with the trainers. And okay. Get, get yeah. Oh, so, let me see here. You got someone to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> looking out for you. <laughs> You're looking kind of anxious. Oh, dude. I got I'm on the call. I know one of the things that comes up is not everybody understands lifting off the, the, the load side mm -hmm. and then being able to ramp the drive up and then testing and Oh, running the drive without a motor connected? Yeah. Load okay. test, yeah. yeah. Test the drive All right. The the motor yeah, actually, yeah, that's, that's most of it. The rest of the stuff and is kind of power yeah. supply, pretty, pretty basic stuff there. Resistor we already talked about. So, yeah, uh, if you don't have any other questions, then yeah, we can go ahead and break out the trainer drives. And well, is that something that you do with those, is where you actually run them um, without... without no those no we well if you took the cover off you could but yeah it's got the whole plexiglass cover like, on there so you can't actually. What would somebody look for if they're getting an error like so uh, balanced voltage is the biggest thing because the the drive is pulling off of a you know this very it should be a very stable DC power supply and all these outputs should be switching in a very controlled manner so your your output voltage on the drive should be very very close you might see one or two volts difference between it so. Say you measure 450, 451, 452 volts, that'd be okay. 
PA or you're on the drive and you saw 450, 451, 420, that, that'd be a big eyebrow raiser there. So well, most of us are going to have the RMS meter, so you're still going to read that high. So yeah, you will ski early like, So high. that's still going to be close, though. Yeah, you, you right? will still, you, you still want to look for a balance change, at least, right? yeah. And then IGBTs are all, if you have a problem, like mm -hmm. you're bleeding AC into your DC, um, do, does that show up on your... On your Not on the uh, IGBT, so those are all on the high voltage side. So, yeah, the AC coming in as DC, that's all on the low voltage control side. But that doesn't show up as a diagnostic? For, uh, oh, you're talking like for testing the IGBTs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For that, let me see, I actually got... It's not a power diode per se. You can do a manual diode test. There's a test, yeah. Let me uh, find that. Pull it up real quick. My, my question was, does the drive pick that up and show it as a diagnostic? It, no. Oh, so yeah, so it won't self-diagnose the elements. <laughs> What's the symptom on that? Something like that. I So this is the this is a document ADE puts out for uh, testing the input and output circuitry on the drive. So uh, I can I can get this to get to this is something we can distribute. They make it publicly available. This actually works for uh, pretty much any drive out there because all the the high voltage side on drives is all the same. We got a diode bridge we're going in, it's the capacitors, and we can go out through a IGBT. So uh, want to make sure that the power has been removed from the drive. The drives had a chance to bleed down, especially on the uh, large drives with these big capacitors. It it'll hold on to that DC voltage for a lot while. So uh, there is a resistor in there to bleed the drive down, but uh, it'll it'll hang on for a while. So make sure the Drives had time to completely de energize. Yeah. What we're looking for, at least on the EDB drives, on the on the smaller drives on the side here, if you look inside the cooling fins, you can see a, a little red shrink tubing and a little yellow shrink tubing. That's our positive and negative terminals on our DC bus. On the uh, larger drives, it's right down in the center here, so it's easy access there. But what you want to do, you put your uh, multimeter in the diode check mode. And then you uh, put one probe on your positive bus, and then your other probe on your, say, A phase input. And uh, they got this table here that shows you what readings you should get. So on your A phase input on one with your polarity set one way, you should get 0.4 volts. If you go to your next phase, it should be 0.4. If your next phase, should be 0.4. Then if you go to the uh, negative bus on your DC bus and move your probe through again, you should go to the uh, overload setting. So we're charging into the capacitor bank, essentially. There's no resistance there. And if you flip your probes, same thing. You're looking for that 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Then you go to the other side of the DC bus, and you want to see that overload, overload, overload. Uh, same idea applies to the uh, outputs. In that case, we're looking at what they call a, uh, the flyback diode rather than the output itself, because the drive's not firing the output if it's turned off. But uh, if that diode gets blown, that's usually an indicator that the IGBT took a hit as well. So that kind of tells us the output on the drive just got fried. But, um, and that, will that show up on your DC bus? Yeah, so you're looking, yeah, the, the test is done between your uh, DC bus and your uh, input terminals, and then your DC bus and your output terminals. So you'll have one of your meter probes on your positive and negative on your DC bus, it doesn't matter. Then you go to your input terminals, ABC, you should have a consistent reading. Then you go to the other terminal on your DC bus and go ABC. And are you condemning a drive after you can, oh, yeah. verifying this? Basically, yeah. you, you know, you got a drive and, and yeah, this is the how we can, not working, yeah. Yeah. and you got to blow a fuse. Yeah. Now, do you just spend $100 and put a fuse in there and put power onto it and see if you can blow, blow the fuse again? No. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you, you go through this here. check here I and you go, pop, 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 pop. oh, I got to blow yeah. up the yeah. yeah. if, if you see a if you see a short or an open where it shouldn't be, then you know right there it's done. So there are circumstances where uh, the drive can pass this test, and when you actually put it under load, then it fails again. But uh, if, if you do this test and it fails somewhere, then you know it's a fail. You, you'll never get a false fail. You might get a false you pass. You can't just replace that bridge, though. You can, yep. Oh, all right. you, uh, it depends on the size of the drive. ABB typically, like if it's under warranty, where they're actually sending out a warranty tech to do a repair on a drive, they you might do it on a 75 horse. It's really more like 100 horse on up is where they'll 
send a guy in with the bridge to replace it. But yeah, the little little drives to just kind of throw away at that point because the the time involved in the labor to swap out that part is going to cost as much it would be to just for ADV to give you another drive. But yeah, I did a uh, I've only done one IGBT replacement on a, I think it was a 250 horse drive, and that was like a seven hour process because you're you're taking the thing completely apart and. It's got to be clean when you put it back together, and you got to put transfer compound on the <laughs> module when you put it to the yeah. yeah. So it's it's a very it's tedious cost process. Cost so they generally cost. don't. It's not cost effective to do a field rebuild. At this point, yeah. But yeah, if you uh, if you got a mind to do something like that, if you got a drive that's blown and you want to, you can uh, get the the diode bridge or the IGBT off like newer Kadijiki, one of those electronics part houses, because it, it's not. A proprietary ABB part, you can get the number off of it and order it and go home and do the repair if you want. So it, it is something that can be done, but it's just the time is typically cost prohibitive to do field repairs until you really get into the large frame drives. But yeah, this uh, I got this available so I can email yeah, us to Seth and yeah, you can distribute to the guys. And so this isn't in like a manual, you can't. Um, no, it's not in their user's manual. It is, it's available online. You can, he has a bunch of documents. But yeah. And it's a, uh, actually, you could, yeah. Yeah, if you Google the ABB static test procedure, you'd find this. But this this works across all drives. It's not unique to uh, ABB. Yeah, it's right up there. Google that. What I do is I just put it in Dropbox. You know, I got an older full PFPs. And, you know, I think that's it there. Yeah. It's one of the ones I, mean, I don't try to do it. I know where it's at. No, you're yeah. dropping. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put it in the middle of the day. I'll put it in the middle of the day. I'll put it in the middle of the day. All right, so yeah, if, uh, do we have any other questions? I guess we can drag out trainers if there's anyone who wants to uh, pull trainer in. If somebody wants to play with the trainer, yeah. Take a moment, yeah. Yeah, if you have a Yeah. 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 And so, you know, I don't, uh, I don't allow uh, 
this one is going to allow the mic to start trying to push it again. Oh, they got a whole specific parameter that you can handle. I'm trying to satisfy my goal. I'm trying to create my view. I think I'd be able to throw my tiny hand. More. More. Yeah. And it is kind of the opposite way you think of it. I do some tea. I do some tea. My own rabbit cool down a rabbit. Yeah. That's how they're. 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 That's how they